Well, hello everyone. Today I'm going to talk to you about something that I know very little about, that I've never actually done myself, but that I've been given uh, publications by uh, Dr. Glenn Wright, who does know what he's doing. And I'm going to share with you what I've learned. Uh, so consider this as like a fifth grade book report on citrus irrigation. Uh, I'm a generalist in uh, extension. I primarily deal with vegetables. I don't deal a lot, a lot with uh, orchard crops, but some of it will be able to transfer over. But when it comes to the specifics of this, we have the expert in the room, just, just right in the back corner, not me. Okay, so today I'm going to talk to you about citrus irrigation. Uh, really, you know, when you're irrigating your trees, we're talking about, uh, you know, how much water do you put on? You can put on too much water, and, uh, you know, that's a precious resource nowadays, so you're not going to have enough of it. And then you're washing away your nutrition. And if you don't have enough, of course, you're limiting yield. So really, we want to talk about putting on just the right amount. And that's what this workshop is going to cover. So we're primarily going to pull from, yes, sir. That last picture you show at that slide says Bridalville. You know where that is? No, where is that? No, you're right. Oh, you're right. Oh, wow. Bridalville Falls. Oh, wow. <laughs> so you know. So they're not educated. Yeah, a lot of citrus there. Nice. Like Yosemite. Uh, so uh, today we're going to talk about this one uh, extension publication in particular called Irrigating Citrus Trees by Dr. Glenn Wright. And we're going to talk about water stress symptoms that we might see, identifying the water needs um, of the trees themselves. Uh, so identifying, you know, the symptoms of not having enough water and then identifying how much water we should put on it. Then talk about salinity and leaching, because here in the desert where it hardly ever rains, that salt will build up in the soil, causing problems. And it's solved like many other things are solved in the desert by adding more water, right? Something that's becoming more and more precious, as previously mentioned. So we even want to do our leaching career. Uh, then we do irrigation strategy, going over the different types of irrigation that are out there, flood, pressurized systems, etc. Then we're going to talk about mulching, whether you should do it or not do it, and how you should do it based on uh, some data that's been generated by different university organizations. So getting into this, let's talk about water stress. As you all probably know, if you've grown any kind of trees, the, there's a very distinct uh, level of uh, deficiency symptoms that develop over time. Um, you can see reduction in fruit size, but that's hard to track, right? It's hard to see visually whether you know, it's smaller this time than last time. Uh, and by then it's too late anyways. Really, you want to catch it early. If you see your leaves turning dull green and then curling inwards, that means your tree is thirsty, obviously. Dry, crisp leaves then start to form at the tip. Then the leaf may entirely fall off the tree. And then you can have flower or fruit fall as well. Um, leading to tree death. It is important to note that uh, if you do stress out a tree during the summer, you may see an early bloom in the fall, uh, one month after the water stress occurs. So if you're seeing something in September and October, an early bloom, it's most likely caused by the water stress that you encounter during the peak summer months. When you talk about citrus water use, um, the mature citrus trees use about 60 inches of water per year. That's not all at once, right? That's metered out throughout the whole year. Um, as much as 17 gallons per day in the winter when it's not pulling as much, and then 135 gallons per day in the summer when we're at peak evapotranspiration. Canopy diameter is used to calculate the water use. This is at the drip line of the tree, which is the, lot, the, the widest part of the canopy. You measure the, the length of the widest part, the length of the widest part on the other side. And that is the dynamic, uh, diameter that you're going to use for these calculations. The table that I'm about to show you right now is for uh, oranges. And you can convert this table over to these other crops by basically by multiplying it, uh, the results that come out for water needs by 20% uh, on grapefruit and lemon as they use 20% more, or mandarins 10% less than the, the oranges displayed on this table. Trees in grass require up to 20% more water just to feed that grass. So just take that into account when you're doing your calculation. 
So question number one for those people online, how much water does a mature citrus tree use in a year? Everybody here in, in person? 60, 60, 60 inches. Okay, here's that table I was talking about. And I know, table, ah, it's too early for this, but I'm gonna to try to break it down as best as I can. So first thing we wanna do for using this table, remember this is for orange, is measure the canopy diameter, the drip line to drip line of the tree in feet. Then we're gonna use the left-hand column of this table to find the row that corresponds to the appropriate diameter of that tree. So take that number and look at that first column. Then using the upper row, find out what month it is, and then the intersection of that will be the daily use uh, in gallons of water for that tree. So for example, if you have a tree canopy diameter of 14 feet and it's July, you can expect to throw down 29.5 gallons of water per day onto that tree. Now it's important to note that we don't want just to put 29 gallons on every day consistently. Um, and we're gonna go into that, the reasons why in, here in a minute. Um, so it'll cause shallow rooting of the tree. If you're just constantly just putting out enough to get the tree what it needs, you're gonna have shallow roots. And when it puts on a fruit load or in a heavy wind, you may have some lodging effects or uh, some branches that will break. It also concentrates the salts because Remember, um, all of the water that we're putting on is slightly salty. If you're coming from straight Colorado River water, it's 1.1 decisiemens. And we've seen a straw, uh, in a recent publication put out by Dr. Charlie Sanchez, he shows that uh, lettuce, which you know is moderately salt tolerant, it can have negative effects to growth at just 1.3 decisiemens. So 1.1, 1.3, we're riding that knife edge of salinity. And when you water shallowly, we're talking about that evaporation happens and then that salt builds up. Like imagine having a, a cup of seawater and just letting all that water evaporate. No, what's left behind the tree? The salt from the ocean. So you're gonna have a lot of salt at the bottom. No one gives it. So we're talking about concentrated salt in the main area growth area for the plant. You know, that's where the atmospheric exchange is happening. So you're creating this really toxic environment right at that thin crust layer at the top of the soil. Uh, you want to protect your irrigated soil with shading or mulch, not all kinds of mulch, because we're gonna get into that in the end, but um, you wanna pr protect that uh, floor from having too much heat or evaporation. And you wanna allow the soils to dry about six inches in between irrigations to limit the soil-borne disease. This is a watering chart for citrus trees. Um, that we can roughly go off of. If it's a newly planted tree, zero to one months, you're gonna wanna irrigate every two to three days year round. If it's two to three months old, then you're gonna wanna irrigate three to five days year round. We start to see our differences in, uh, um, in um, at the four month to one year mark, where we start to see different amounts of water uh, needing to be put out at different times of the year. And the one to two years, it's more, and three to three or four more, it's more pronounced. Dr. Wright, do you have something to say? Yeah, just to mention that that's basically for flood irrigation. If you're using micro sprinklers like you would around here, one of those lines, I think it's the four months to a year line, is not the appropriate interval for micro sprinklers. So, so if you're if you're using micro sprinklers, you're going to have to adjust that four month to one year line to something more appropriate for. Yeah, I mean, like two to five days in the middle of the summertime is a, a generally appropriate for for micro sprinklers. Two to five days in the summertime, yeah. but you would never want to irrigate every ten to fourteen days using micro sprinklers in the summer. You'd kill your tree. So, but for flood irrigation, that works pretty good. Okay, sounds good. I'll talk to the author when we will do yeah. a revision. I think we, it's in there, but it's in the small print. So. The small print. <laughs> All right, so salty water is causes an issue in trees. Citrus is mildly tolerant to salty water, good for us. Um, but again, that concentrated salt can be problem problematic, causing root dieback and the leaf loss. This is your classic symptoms of salt uh, stress. You'll see that uh, burning of the leaf fringes, leaf loss more of a problem in clay than sand as 
you know, it's a salt and that low CEC just lets that salt wash right through. Um, so talking about leaching now, uh, when we're talking about basin or flood irrigation, um, that's primarily how we're controlling our leaching, although it can be done with sprinklers but it's or drip, but you just have to leave it running for a long period of time. Um, you can have salt burning with your micro sprinklers or drip if that water touches the foliage, so make sure that doesn't happen. You can have clogged emitters from the salts, so watch out for that. Have a very good uh, cleaning program. And then frequent and shallow irrigation can lead to salt crusting, as mentioned earlier. You're building up that very concentrated level of salt on the top layer of soil. So you kind of want to leach your soils once or twice a year, preferably with basin flooding, but you can use the pressure uh, systems. And then if you add gypsum, that's that calcium and the, the sulfate there will create that acid, mobilizing the calcium, which will displace that sodium and everything. All right, so if you're at home and you wanna do some water calculations, how do I know how, to, how much to water my tree? Well, uh, one cubic foot equals 7.5 gallons. Uh, for those conversions, some of your home um, monitors may be on cubic foot uh, measurements. Uh, you can calibrate your meter to make sure it's running properly. Turn everything off in your house. Note where your water level is. Fill two five-gallon buckets. Well, that'll be 10 gallons. So that'll be 1.33 cubic feet for you. If you want to do your home calibrations. There are weather-based smart irrigation controllers. Here's a link to uh, a list of... Uh, smart controllers given out by the city of Tempe. They have a, a, a program where you can purchase these and they'll, they'll pay you back. So if you want to see a list of approved smart controllers that you can plug into your home system, um, that takes into account weather data and will just water all your plants appropriately. Um, this is, this is a, a list for that. Uh, there's also, you can, you can check out your garden hose and measure how many gallons per minute are coming out and then adjust the time to reach the desired output. For example, five gallons per minute equals 150 gallons per 30 minutes. So put out the right amount of water, just don't turn it on and walk away, forget about it. And don't put that in your... You can also use drip irrigation. When purchasing drip irrigation, you want to look at the wall thickness. You may need a thick wall. You may not, depending upon how long you want to use this for, depending upon the wear and tear, if you're going to put it on the surface versus burying it. Um, drip emitters are measured pretty much on two different things. They're either gallon per hour per emitter. Um, and then, so if you want to get the total flow rate of what's coming out of that, you have to know your emitter flow for each emitter, how, how far are they spaced on that tape, and then what total tape length they're gonna use. And you can do all those calculations and figure out how much water you're gonna output. Um, count emitters active, that are actively watering the tree, because remember, if you're watering outside of that root zone, it's not gonna be, it's not gonna go to that tree. Now that tree is gonna stretch to get it, but you're also asking that tree to do a lot of work. You're stretching those roots probably beyond the canopy where it's gonna be protected from shade, so it's not ideal. You can also look at gallons per minute per 100 feet, and remember in your calculations to, that you're putting in that 100 feet. So uh, when you're figuring out how much area it's covered, you have to do that 100 feet calculation. A high flow rate, like what we use at the drip, uh, um, at the yak farm for vegetables would be 0.68 gallons per minute per 100 feet. A low flow, the, I've tried to order from Rain for Rent the lowest flow drip tape I could get, and it was only 0.44 gallons per minute per 100 feet. The emitters were very small, but they were spaced like six inches apart, so. Then you were talking micro sprinklers, looking online, I found the highest flow rate I could find was 30.6 gallons per hour, and the lowest flow rate, 3.7 gallons per hour. So get whatever is appropriate to your farm and your irrigation uh, regime. You can also apply uh, water via basin. Um, at, at home, you basically constrict, construct a four to eight inch wooden die, I mean, not wooden, uh, dirt, or let's say concrete, a little ring around your tree. And you want it to go about one foot beyond the canopy. And remember that it's gonna grow over time uh, because those roots are gonna stretch a little bit out beyond that canopy. Uh, when watering via basin application, uh, don't bank the soil around the base of the tree trunk. If 
your tree trunk is healthy and there's no wounds, you can put water up against the base of it and it's not gonna cause an issue uh, as long as it's drained out in a reasonable amount of time. Talking about irrigation strategy, um, if you're growing, these are just some miscellaneous items, some housekeeping. If you're growing grass, you're gonna have to add more water. If you're placing your micro sprinkler or drip, wherever you put that, you are training the roots. It's just like training the top of the tree with bonsai. You're gonna train the bottom of the roots, bottom of the tree with uh, where you put the water because they will grow to that and the, they're not gonna move beyond that too far. Pressurized system maintenance. Well, first of all, you have to have a good design. Make sure you have a good flushing um, capabilities in your system. You, and if you wanna recapture that flush water, you can. But part of what, what you have to do will be purging that drip line and getting all that precipitates uh, out of the system. Uh, put some acid in there typically to mobilize that salt, to mobilize that kind of calcium that might have calcification that might have built up in there. Purge it out, algicide. Sometimes there can be algae in this hot weather that grows within your drip line. So you may want to run some algae, just algicide through it. And then again, regular flushing. That's the key to having a good drip system. Mulch can sometimes be used to keep moisture in the root zone. However, that can be problematic as some research has shown that heavy mulch can create wet soil conditions, which can spread soil borne disease. Uh, and also if you're bringing, let's say wood chips or something from offsite, you really have to watch out to make sure that that's clean material and you're not putting you know, a bunch of diseased material right at the base of your tree. Only leaf litter mulch from the tree is recommended as mulch. So take what you have and mulch it up and put it under your tree. Uh, moisture and temperature are protected from the low growing canopy instead, which is kind of what's recommended instead of mulch. So you let, the sh you let the tree itself kind of create that shade that provides that mulch. Other publications when it comes to uh, citrus irrigation that I found just to cover real quick. This is Efficient Irrigation and Nitrogen Management for Lemons, 1993 to 95 publication by Sanchez, Wilcox, Wright and Brown, talking about Lisbon lemons, soil moisture depletion, which is um, you know, letting your soil dry down. And um, uh, this, this number is uh, kind of showing uh, that, that basically the higher the number is the, uh, I always get this confused. Uh, Glenn, what is it? The higher the number, the, the, higher, the higher the number means you're watering more, less frequently. So less frequently, yeah. allowing it to drop 70%. Yeah. So basically you need, you need that. Yeah. You need to raise it up. 25 so, was so too 25 wet. is slightly too wet. Too wet. Yeah. All right. So in this in this route, we found that um, with this study that uh, the soil moisture depletion level of forty percent was ideal. Um, so don't get it too wet. Don't get it too dry. Micro sprinkler irrigation produced more tree growth than flood and drip at this stage, and pressurized systems produced a higher first year yield. Uh, nitrogen going from 0 0.22, 0 0.44, 0 0.88 pounds per nitrogen per tree. There was no growth drip difference in the trees but the yield was seen to increase at the highest nitrogen rate at, if you also paired it with the highest moisture level as well. So question two, what soil moisture depletion level was found to be the best in lemons? Everybody, 40. Root density, this is another publication, root density, spatial distribution of mature Valencia oranges irrigated with pressurized systems from Wright, Cool, Kuai, Panda, and Roth and Gardner. Uh, mature orange trees were converted from border flood irrigation to drip basin flood micro sprinkler border flood irrigate border flood in this uh, experiment just to see can you convert uh, a flood orchard to let's say a pressurized system orchard roots were sa samples were collected after four years they put a grid out in the field and collected them at different depths they found that no significant differences in root density were if you averaged over all depths of the trial However, um, the roots were concentrated below emitters in a drip system, and they were more spread out in a flood system to, to capture everything. Um, so I, it, it was really training. What I got out of this is that putting in those systems, the, the trees were okay. Uh, they just 
needed a little time to adjust the roots and they were able to adjust just fine. Would you say, would you agree with that, Dr. Wright? Yes. All right, other things that I'm working on in cooperative extension that I wanna share with you that are not really related to citrus irrigation per se, but in irrigation as a whole. We have a water irrigation efficiency grant program that I'd like to promote with you today. There's a good promo video here. I also have some cards in the back that really detail it. It has some politicians in it as well, promoting this. State legislature gave cooperative extension $45 million to get the farmers to pay for conversion of flood irrigation to systems that are 20% more efficient. If you are a flood citrus grower and you wanna convert over to micro sprinklers, we will help you with that, uh, both in funding and in, in uh, assistance uh, recommendations. Uh, so you aren't gonna just get it and you'll be alone. We'll be here to help. So we'll pay $1,500 per acre, up to $1 million per farm but you have to show a 20% irrigation efficiency improvement over time. And then this also signs you up to have us assist to come to your farm and work with you for the next three years on getting it installed. So for those online, how much money does the irrigation efficiency grant provide to growers? Well, 1 million, I wanna get that across. 1 million, 1 million, 1 million, 1 million. Yes, but how much per acre? 1,500. 1,500, $1,500 per acre. 1 million per farm. All right, moving along. Last year I stood in this very room and I made a presentation to you about South, South African uh, citrus pr uh, production video and how they uh, teach cleanliness to their workers in the field, field sanitation, things like that. And I asked you a bunch of questions about what we should make in our citrus brown wood rot video. Well, we started to make that video. Um, we uh, interviewed Dr. Wright and a uh, citrus uh, producer in Yuma, Tyler Woodman. We're also going to be uh, interviewing Alex Hu and uh, really getting some good film on, on them pruning. I didn't realize how bad of a situation this was, but Tyler was taking me around to different fields in Yuma and he's saying, look at this field, it's kind of damaged. You know, I had this field, but now, now it has a different owner and they aren't taking care of it. Look, one year later, we're starting to see some damage. And then we look at this field next to it. And here's what it's gonna look like, this empty field with burn piles, maybe two years from now, because it's gonna be just toast. So uh, we're working on putting together that video and, uh, and I hope it's gonna be very impactful and show people the value of field sanitation, even though it's an extra expense, how it's gonna extend the longevity of your. So uh, that's all I have. Um, if everybody has any questions, I will gladly direct them to Glenroy. <laughs> <laughs>
Now, uh, one of the nice things about PQZ is that it's bringing a different mode of action for most of the target pests, which includes uh, thrips and aphids. Uh, and there is no cross resistance between PQZ and any other insecticide that is primarily being used to control thrips and citrus. When it comes to registration, it is now registered for use uh, in Arizona, but the California registration is still pending. Some of the general properties of PQZ in terms of the effective use rates, it, our label recommends anywhere from 3.4 to 6.4 uh, fluid ounces per acre. We recommend the top label uh, rate for the use on thrips, which is 6.4 fluid ounces. Uh, the chemistry acts both via contact residual and translaminar activity, meaning that uh, if insect uh, can feed on, on the treated uh, tissue and it will take it up via ingestion, it can walk over a treated surface and pick it up through their legs, or it can be, and become, become in direct contact with the spray at the time of application. So a very effective type of chemistry. It is active both on the adults and the info stages of the insect, giving a very quick knockdown activity on all stages. Uh, spray coverage is going to be very important, so we always recommend the use of 415 oil or a very good uh, uh, spreader to help with the application. Uh, in terms of the residual activity, we're looking at about anywhere from 10 to 14 days. It depends uh, uh, depending on the, uh, in the target insect species, but for thrips, we're looking at about 10 to 14 days of chemical residual activity uh, once uh, the application is made. Speed of activity, again, it's a very fast acting uh, insecticide on thrips. You can see death thrip anywhere from one to two days after the application, full effect about three to five days uh, after, after treatment. Uh, with this chemistry, we do have to make sure that we have a neutral to a slightly acidic um, conditions in the tank. Otherwise, the uh, product could be uh, hydrolyzed or degraded uh, in solution if the pH is too high. So keep it neutral to a slightly acidic. In terms of a pre-harvest interval, it's fantastic. PH, uh, PQZ only has a one-day PHI, giving you a lot of flexibility, especially with those applications that are close to harvest or when you have uh, fruit from, from last, uh, last season. Spectrum of activity, uh, I've been mentioning that PQC right now we're positioning in citrus primarily as a thrips material. It also has excellent activity on aphids, y fly, other species of thrips, contact activity on mealybug, and it also offers a good activity on, but only on the crawler stages of scales. So again, different mode of action, uh, a different uh, product for the majority of these target pests. One of the nice things about PQZ is that, as you can see, it's a very narrow spectrum type of insecticide, which means that it's very selective when it comes to beneficial insects. PQZ is non-disruptive to the majority of the beneficial insects, uh, including bees. So it is offering different mode of action, so fantastic for resistance management. So overall, it's got a very nice fit for in an IPM approach. Let's look a little bit of uh, data here showing the, uh, the effectiveness of the material relative to the current standards. Uh, in this case, a study conducted in the greenhouse by Dr. Joel Morris in Riverside. We can see here that PQZ relative to Delegate has excellent knockdown activity and very similar uh, length of residual activity as, as Delegate. Uh, in uh, lemons in, in Yuma, uh, back back when when David Kearns was still at an entomologist there, he evaluated PQZ versus success, and you can see in terms of the quality of the fruit at harvest showed excellent activity relative to success. Now, more recently, Dr. John Palombo has been evaluating PQZ, comparing it to the current standards, uh, and once again, it continues uh, PQZ continues to provide excellent activity on, on thrips. In this last uh, study in 2018, again, comparing it to even more uh, standard materials showing PQZ as one of the best performing insecticides in the market for, for thrip control. Second product I'd like to cover today is Bexar. Now, Bexar is a much broader spectrum of activity in insecticide. Uh, Bexar's active ingredient is tolfemperad. This chemistry has been classified under IRAC group 21A, which are the mitochondrial electron transfer inhibitors. Uh, this chemistry, essentially, the way it works is by targeting the production of energy in the mitochondria. So in terms of activity, very fast acting, much broader spectrum of activity. But it, it does offer a different mode of action for the majority of the target pests, including uh, thrips and ACP. And there is no cross resistance between Bexar and any other insecticide outside of group 21A. Again, offering a different mode of action for most of the 
target passed. In terms of registrations in Arizona, uh, Bexars, it's got a registration for use in Citrus. In Citrus, we're offering excellent knockdown activity, contact activity on Citrus thrips. Also very effective on all stages of development of Asian Citrus psyllid. Excellent activity on soft scales, red mite, some, some uh, mite species, including red mite, broad mite, uh, Texas mite, a lot of the Europhyte mites, very good activity, although it does not control spider mites. Uh, it's got excellent activity on aphid and contact activity on mealybugs, so it's more than just a thrips material. Use rates, we recommend uh, 21, 27 fluid ounces per acre. Uh, this material is primarily a contact with the short residual activity. Uh, when it comes to thrips, Bexar is the hammer. It's like a reset button. It almost doesn't matter how, how bad the infestation will be. Bexar will zero out the population with one or two days after application. However, uh, it's important to note that under very heavy infestations, it may require a follow-up application of another uh, affected thrip, thrips materials at around seven, uh, seven days after the application because Bexar does not have the residual activity to cover um, beyond that uh, five to seven days. So spray coverage is going to be very important being that Bexar is a contact type material. So we always recommend the use of a good spreader, 415 oil, uh, tractor speed, very, very important when it comes to thrip control, probably no more than two miles an hour is recommended, not just for Bexar, but any of, of the thrip materials to maximize the performance of the application. Uh, as a PHI, very flexible. It's got only a three-day PHI, giving you a lot of flexibility, especially with those applications that are made uh, close to harvest. And it's got a, a re-entry interval of only 12 hours. Now I'll show you some data uh, looking at different conditions when Bexar is used. Bexar can be used to control thrips under very heavy infestations. As we can see here in this, this study, we're looking at about 45% infested fruit with multiple thrips, both adult and larvae. As we can see, we make the application less than three days, three days after treatment, we see excellent knockdown activity of all stages, adults and nymphs. In this case, we're comparing it to delegate, performing excellent, excellent knockdown out to about seven days. Beyond that, uh, we see the, the population start to rebound uh, on both uh, products. And again, this is primarily because we're not controlling, we're, although we're controlling the larval stages in the adults, we don't have activity on the eggs that are embedded into the tissue. These eggs end, end up hatching beyond the residual um, power or, or residual activity of the Bexar. That's why it will require a second application right around seven days if, if the populations are uh, strong or heavy enough. But again, excellent knockdown activity. Now, in, under more normal conditions uh, where you're looking at a thrip population that's in the 5-10% infested fruit, you make the application, uh, it's going to look like Bexar's got 14-21 days of residual activity. But in reality is that you're cutting off the um, uh, life cycle of the insect, allowing for much better control, much better uh, uh, control of the, of the infestation. So here, excellent knockdown three days, out to 21 days, start to see some come back at 28 days. But again, remember the Bexart, it is a hammer, it's a reset button for thrips, uh, but under heavy infestations, it may require a follow-up application. The third product I'd like to cover today is Fujimite. Fujimite has been known to be a standard for mite control for uh, quite some time now. Uh, Fujimite's active ingredient is femperoxamate, also in chino chemistry. This chemist chemistry is also classified under IRA group 21A, so it's the same chemistry class uh, as Bexar, but different in uh, spectrum of activity and also in safety to beneficial insects. So if you're looking for a soft approach to uh, mite control, this is the, the product to go with. Fujimite is formulated as a suspension concentrate, which means that it's very compatible mixing with other insecticides, fungicides, micronutrients. Uh, so overall, pretty benign. This one is not affected by, by pH. Uh, again, it's very very uh, uh, selective when it comes to beneficial insects, non-toxic to the majority of the beneficial insects, uh, with the exception of predatory mites. There's still mites, and Fujimite is a strong miticide. Uh, but when it comes to parasitoids, uh, general predators, Fujimite will not touch them. In terms of that use rate, Fujimite, we recommend uh, for most cases, two pints. Two pints is all you need, uh, even though our label recommends anywhere from two to four pints. But two pints is a standard uh, rate for mite thrip, uh, insect control when you're using this product. So uh, remember, two pints will be enough for most cases. Uh, we recommend that those two pints in combination with a good spreader surfactant, 415 oil at 1%, uh, 
a tractor speed of only two miles an hour and uh, spray volume of anywhere from 100 to 200 gallons of water, depending on the size of those trees. Uh, Fuji mite, when it comes to pre-harvest interval, very uh, flexible too. It's only got a three-day PHI. Again, giving you uh, some uh, very good uh, flexibility when it comes to uh, harvest, uh, you know, fruit that may be in there from, from last season. In terms of the pest of activity, I mean, Fuji mite has long been used primarily as a miticide. Uh, one of the advantages that Fuji mite has over other miticides is the spectrum of control. Fuji mite just takes out any type of mite species where other miticides are more specific to spider mites or certain mites. Uh, Fuji mite kills them all and it, it takes out from egg up to adult, very quick knockdown within a couple of days, you know, the mites are done. But one of the other differences and other benefits of using Fujimite as your miticide is that it's offering more than just mite control. Fujimite's got excellent knockdown activity on citrus thrips, both adults and larval, although the residual activity is not very strong, but if you're treating for mites and you have thrip out there or you want to suppress that thrip population, Fujimite is an excellent option there. Also, if you have Asian citrus psyllidae in that orchard, you're treating for mites or thrip, and you got ACP in there, Fujimite will provide excellent control of ACP. It's that's actually one of the primary uses of this product over in Florida for ACP control. And it's got activity also on egg, uh, from eggs up to the adult stage. Aside from ACP, it's got excellent activity on uh, soft scales, leaf hoppers, and it's got contact activity on, on citrus mealy bugs. Like I mentioned before, uh, one of the differences between Fujimite and other miticides is that this product controls all stages of the mites, including eggs up to the adults. Same thing for uh, psyllids, eggs up to the adults. Uh, the key is getting direct contact with those with those eggs and that those insects in order to maximize the performance of Fujimite. Now, we established the Fujimite has long been used primarily as a miticide. Uh, today, I'd like to take the time to go over uh, more of the insecticidal uh, spectrum of activity. In this case, we're looking at adult ACP. This is a study over from Florida, comparing Fujimite two to four pines versus the pyrethroids. As we can see here from this data, even the two pyrate uh, does a fantastic job on uh, the adult, knocking down adult ACP populations for quite some time. We look at the, also the nymphal stages. We see that two pines of Fujimite, it's comparable to the pyrethroids, which have been uh, used quite a bit, and we may need to be rotating those chemistries to prevent developmental resistance uh, for ACP, whether single applications or in area-wide spray program. But Fujimite is a very good alternative to pyrethroids when it comes to ACP. This uh, past fall, I uh, also wanted to demonstrate the uh, uh, knockdown activity of Fujimide on thrips. So I conducted a study on uh, one-year-old citrus trees. They are very lush, they attract thrips. You can assure that the thrips are gonna be there. Uh, as we can see this in this leaf, multiple stages of thrip, both adult and the larval stages. So it's an excellent place to test out what materials have activity beyond thrip. As you can see here from the data, uh, we I compare Fujimai two and three pines to Agrimec and Savanto. Uh, both, all the products here uh, show excellent knockdown activity. You can see it on, on the data up to about seven days, which is represented by the gray bar. As we can see, most uh, Fujimai started to break it around seven days. Same thing for Savanto. But overall, we see excellent knockdown activity on the larval stages, so thrips on these, uh, on these young trees. Similar results were observed on the adult stage of thrips. Again, both Agrimec, Fujimai, and Savanto reducing the, uh, the adult population relative to the intreated control up to about probably no more than, than three days because the seven days we see, we see the adults coming back on, on all the treatments. But again, good knockdown if you're looking for alternatives for, uh, for a thrip control or suppression. Here's a visual where you can expect. We have the untreated, it's got a nice secondhand star there, nice and plump, where you can see in the adult here in the middle uh, a picture. That's an adult, has been treated with Fujimides, dead, stuck on the leaf. And here on the last picture here, we see a larval stage of a thrib that has been treated, is dried up, it's been treated with Fujimide and it's all dried up. So how do we use Fujimide uh, in citrus? Again, the, for, for thrib suppression control, uh, we're recommending two pints per acre. In, in 125 to 100 gallons of water per acre, 
with a tractor speed of only two miles per hour. We recommend use of an adjuvant, preferably 415 oil. Uh, this application will give you knockdown of thrip, may not be full control, control, but if you're looking to knock down the populations or if you're treating for mites or, or psyllid and you're looking to reduce the thrip population, uh, which will be a nice option. It is going to be a short residual type of material, probably no more of than seven days of control. Uh, this could be a product that you can use right around bloom timing as Fujimai is non-toxic to bees. If you're looking to knock down the populations before they start uh, hurting the, uh, the fruit after petal fall. Again, activity both on adult and larval stages, no bee, acti no bee activity from Fujimide. Uh, and again, it's a broader spectrum uh, type of application. Last but not least, Centaur, which is our uh, insta growth regulator, PHI. What is it offering for citrus growers? Well, Centaur is a narrow spectrum insecticide, very effective against red scale, soft scales, cottony cushion scale. In my opinion, is the best cottony cushion uh, scale material in the market. It's got excellent activity in wax scales, mealybugs, as they are becoming more and more of a problem in citrus. Centaur is one of the best mealybug materials in the market. <clears throat> when it comes to red scale, against one of the main pests of uh, citrus, you don't have a whole lot of options. Uh, for, for this pest. So uh, Centaur is an excellent rotational partner, very unique mode of action, is, uh, pairs up really well in rotation with Movento Esteem or even uh, Seven. So a, in terms of the stages that are susceptible uh, to uh, Centaur being an instant growth regulator, the crawler stage is the most susceptible stage, but Centaur can control scales up to the second instar but before the second molt. After the second molt, they essentially become uh, uh, young or immature uh, uh, females. Uh, so we're looking at about um, of, uh, about 10 to 14 days after crawler hatch, where you have a window where you can effectively control red scale with uh, with Centaur. Uh, we can target crawler hatches. Uh, beginning of crawler hatches is the, is the best application uh, timing. You don't have to hit the scale in order to control it. Put it on uh, on the tree and the scales as they crawl around uh, looking for a place to feed. They'll pick it up and they'll never make it to the next stage. So what do we recommend for red scale control uh, in terms of uh, timing? You can target crawler emergence, uh, both first or second generations. A spray volume, you need a high water volume because you need to cover the scale that's on the trunk of the trees. 500, 1,000 gallons of water per acre uh, with the tractor speed of, of one to one and a half, one and a quarter miles per hour. And we always recommend the use of a good spreader or oil. Uh, and some of the spray programs, like I said before, Centaur is very compatible in rotation with the Movento or, or with even with the steam. If you're looking for a rescue treatment a combination of Centaur plus a sale, uh, following the application parameters mentioned before, it does a fantastic job. Another pest that is becoming a major problem in citrus is mealybugs. This is uh, uh, another product, another pest that is targeted by Centaur. Uh, excellent activity on mealybugs. They're alone in combination with uh, with the sale. Uh, this too, uh, you want to target the uh, crawler hatches of mealybugs varies from three to four uh, generations per year, depending on where you are. But uh, again, spray coverage is very important. If you're looking for uh, the best treatment that the industry has to offer, uh, that is a combination of Centaur plus a sale. And this is how you do it. Uh, you put it again, 500 to 750 gallons of water per acre. You want to treat and cover all the way into the uh, trunk of the trees. Uh, drive slow and get good coverage and rotate chemistries. This is, I just wanted to finish up by showing you what can be achieved against mealybug with this combination of Centaur plus a sale. This is even a rescue treatment. You have all stages pressing. You got the contact knock knock activity of the uh, sale plus the residual activity, which is the power of Santar covering you from two to three weeks after the application on any of those crawlers. So this is what you can expect from that combination seven days after treatment. 
that's all you have that's all i have for you today i appreciate the opportunity if you guys have any questions feel free to reach out to andy hancock which is our local technical sales rep uh, at this contact information or you, you can reach out directly to me uh, here's my number and my email address with that thank you very much and appreciate your time okay excellent good morning everybody and um I thank the meeting organizers for the opportunity to to talk this morning. Um, I'm just going to turn on my cell phone. Oh, Glenn, are you tracking the time? Could you give me uh, a warning in about seven minutes out, yeah. please? Yes. Okay. Thank you. I, I, no way. I won't have to keep looking at my what clock. Okay. So, yes, I was asked to provide updates on Asian citrus psyllid and the South American palm weevil uh, invasions into Southern California. These are two pest species that... Uh, potentially have impacts in Arizona. Asian citrus psyllid is already established in southern Arizona's citrus growing areas, and uh, South American palm weevil is slowly expanding its range in San Diego County and may ultimately invade the date, edible date production areas of the Bard Valley and the Coachella Valley in, in California. So I'm going to start with Asian citrus psyllid. I've titled this Crushing the Curve. Um, basically, what we've been looking at here are ways to suppress population densities of Asian citrus psyllid with a primary focus on biological control agents targeting the nymphs of this insect and also through ant management strategies that can um, increase biological control efficacy when ants are controlled in citrus orchards. So this is really a story of, of three different players. We're going to be talking about the Asian citrus psyllid. This is an adult that you can see here on this green citrus leaf. We're going to be talking about the parasitoid Tamarixia radiata that we imported from Pakistan. Then we'll move on to the work that we're doing on Argentine ant, which oh. interferes with the natural enemies that attack not only Asian citrus psyllid, but uh, other sap-sucking pests that infest California citrus as well. And then we'll finish up with some work that we're doing on conservation biological control where we are trying to enhance resident populations of natural enemies, such as these hoverfly larvae, which are voracious predators of ACP nymphs and other soft-bodied pests like aphids in citrus orchards. So a little bit about the life cycle of uh, Diaphorina citri, the Asian citrus psyllid. All of the population phenology of this pest is driven by flush growth. If there is no flush on the citrus tree, there'll be no egg laying. Females need that soft, tender growth to induce egg laying. Those eggs are then laid in the uh, flush growth clusters, and then those eggs hatch within a couple of days, and then the nymphs will move their wades down from those soft leaves onto these young green stems where they'll insert their sucking mouth parts, and then they will begin to feed on the phloem. And as a result of that, they will then produce these white tendrils, which is basically honeydew within a waxy tube. And it is this product, the honeydew, that Argentine ants find very attractive. It is a sugar resource for this sugar-feeding ant, and they will basically guard their livestock from natural enemies that are trying to attack these sap-sucking pests. So those nymphs, once they have hatched out of their eggs, they settle down in their feeding, will go through five nymphal instars. And then after the final molt, the adult form will be present, and they'll have wings and legs, and they can fly around and move from tree to tree. The adults have this very characteristic 45 degree angle when they feed. Essentially, when the adults get ready to feed, they collapse their front legs. It's almost as if they're going down to prey. And then they insert their needle-like mouth parts into the flow of the citrus tree and they start feeding. Now, the major problem with, with Asian citrus psyllid is not so much that it's sucking sap. It's actually pretty easy to kill with insecticides if it's not resistant like it is in Florida. But the fact that it can inject into the plant a bacterium, Candidatus liberibacter asiaticus, that causes a lethal citrus disease known as Huang Long Bing or citrus greening. Asian citrus psyllids can acquire the bacterium in two different life stages. So if the nymphs are feeding on an HLB positive tree, one that's infected with the bacterium, and they acquire that bacterium as nymphs, when they become adults, they are very efficient at spreading that bacteria from tree to tree when they feed. If the adult stage comes through the nymphal developmental process without acquiring the bacterium, but then acquires the bacterium as an adult because it's flown onto an infected tree, 
the adults, when they acquire that bacterium in the adult stage, are not as efficient as spreading the bacterium from tree to tree. So one of the major risks of C-class or HLB spread is acquisition in the nymphal stage. And the biological control program can help us very strongly with this because all of our natural enemies go after the nymphal stages of Asian citrusillid. So this is a, a scanning SEM of um, the, the bacterium, Candidatus liberibacter, that's infesting the uh, phloem tubes of, of a citrus tree. And once the tree is infected, basically the physiology of the tree changes. And as a result of those physiological changes, fruit becomes small, misshapen. They tend to produce a bitter juice. They won't ripen regularly. This is how the uh, common name citrus greening comes about. You can see the bottom half of this orange hasn't, or, hasn't oranged up <laughs> properly. And often, almost always, these fruit will drop prematurely from trees. This is very prevalent in Florida. When you walk through the orchards, you can see loads of of prematurely dropped citrus sitting under HLB positive trees. The leaves also become the chlorotic looking. And a, a, a key signature here is these irregular patterns of yellow and green splodges across the leaf. It's not zebra stripe, like when you see leaves that suffer from zinc deficiencies, for example. And ultimately within about five to eight years, those trees die. And there is currently no cure for an infected tree. Some work has been done with antibiotics. And they provide some level of control, but this is an impractical and highly costly method of, of trying to save an infected tree. So what happened in Florida? Well, Asian citrus psyllid was first found in Florida in 1998. Seven years later, the pathogen was detected. And then within four years, from 2005 to 2009, more than 60,000 acres of citrus had been destroyed. This was costing the industry, probably still is, about $330 million a year in losses. More than 8,000 jobs have been lost. And at the last ESA meeting that I went to in 2022, there was an HLB ACP symposium. And the Florida researchers were providing evidence that acreage has declined by more than 75% in Florida. And there's a lot of discussion now that maybe Florida citrus production is you know, on the verge of, of commercial extinction. Okay, so California, after ACP and HLB were detected here, have been watching this horror show unfolding in, in Florida, very concerned that a similar calamity was going to occur here in California as well. So the initial response to the ACP invasion into California was by the USDA and the California Department of Food and Ag to basically try and spray their way out of this program, set up boundaries, try and contain ACP in these urban areas where they were infesting backyard and front yard and side yard citrus trees. And then not only to contain it, but to drive those numbers down to such low levels that they would successfully eradicate the pest. Well, this didn't happen. So after a couple of years of, of spraying, um, a lot of resistance from homeowners to having their property sprayed and millions of dollars spent, the spray program was abandoned. So starting in 2010, we then had the opportunity to initiate the classical biological control program against Asian citrusillid. So classical biological control involves going back to the home range of the invasive pest to look for natural enemies that have co-evolved with the target organism. So ACP is thought to be native to the Indian subcontinent, and it has a large range that essentially stretches from Afghanistan right through into parts of Southeast Asia. And over that very vast geographic range, there are a high variety of, of climates. So for example, in Indonesia, it's very hot, humid, and it rains a lot. But California doesn't have a climate like that. So if we bring natural enemies in, we want them to come from a part of the native range where they have evolved with the target pest and where they are familiar or have adapted to a climate similar to California. Well, using climate modeling software, we identified Punjab, Pakistan as a good area to go. It's part of the native range. Natural enemies are present in this range and it has about a 70% climate match with California. So we were based in the Department of Entomology here at the University of Agriculture in Faisalabad. Gujranwala, Sagoda, and Tobatek Singh are the large citrus production areas in Punjab, Pakistan. They grow enough citrus to supply the local market, and they have enough excess fruit left over to uh, export internationally as well. So sometimes in these orchards, we would be working in areas that were considered risky, and we would have armed guards. These are um, 
Punjabi elite commando units that, that came with us. We never needed any assistance from these guys. The folks that we worked with, the farmers in the local villages, were, were always extremely accommodating and welcoming when we showed up to look for natural enemies in these orchards. This is what we were looking for. This is Tamarixia radiata. It is a nymphal parasitoid, and this is the star of the show that we will be talking about. So we brought those parasitoids under permit back to the quarantine facility at UCR. We did a lot of work in quarantine, demonstrated that they pose no undue risk to California. We got approval to release those parasitoids in December 2011 from USDA APHIS. Those parasitoids have now been released and established in Arizona as well. So even though it was winter time when we released the parasitoid here in California, it established immediately. And the reason for that was that these front yard, back yard, side yard citrus trees were drenched and they were literally dripping with Asian citrus psyllids. There were thousands of these pests on these trees. There was so much food there that Tamarixia was able to not only host feed, but it had an abundance of hosts to parasitize as well. And once we released it, very simply by tying these vials into the trees and opening the lids, the parasitoid began to spread very, very fast. We would go to new release sites five to eight miles away from the initial release sites and the parasite was already there and we were finding large clusters almost like barnacles on rocks of acp nymphs that had all these parasitoid emergence holes in them so the question was wow this is exceeding our expectations right now are the parasitoids we're finding in the field actually from pakistan or have they come from somewhere else did they hitchhike in with Asian citrusilid from some other part of the world. Well, Paul Rugman Jones in uh, Richard Stouthammer's lab looked at the DNA, developed these haplotype, uh, mitochondrial haplotype networks for us. And the material that we were recovering from the field had this very distinct Pakistani genetic fingerprint. So the only way those parasitoids got into those areas of, of Los Angeles County, San Diego, Riverside and San Bernardino counties in Southern California was because we put them there. They had established and they were spreading. So that was great news for us. But then the ultimate question is, well, did they do anything? What impacts did they have on the target pest population? Well, the impacts have been enormous. This graph shows two lines. In this light blue color, you can see the numbers of psyllids that we were counting on citrus. And the magenta line here shows the impacts from the parasitoid Tamarixia radiata measured in terms of percent parasitism. So before the biological control program, these timed one minute searches, we were counting hundreds of psyllids on those infested citrus trees in urban areas. Following the release of the parasitoid, we didn't see anything for a while. And then suddenly the parasitoid shows up and it's had a massively suppressive effect on ACP populations. So you can see the blue line following the establishment of the parasitoid it has never rebounded back to the levels that we saw before the biological control program was initiated. Each time Asian citrusilla populations creep up, the parasitoid responds strongly and they drive them back down to low levels. Another little blip, the parasitoid responds. And then another small blip right here with a very strong response from the parasitoid. So we've run multiple studies, at least we've done two of these now, three to four years at a time, running from the coast of California through the central areas like Riverside, right out into the desert in the Coachella Valley. The data are very clear. Following the establishment of Tamarixia radiata and its subsequent spread through California, ACP populations have declined by more than 70%. In fact, some of these impacts now are so big that the CDFA is considering strongly to discontinue its monitoring program because a lot of their sites have been ACP free for more than two years now. So in addition to seeing parasitism in the field through measured through those exit holes of the nymphs where the parasitoids had emerged, we were also finding a lot of dead Asian citrusilid nymphs, and we did not know what was killing those nymphs. So to get to the bottom of that particular question, what was causing those levels of unknown mortality, we developed these micro video cameras using Raspberry Pi technology, and we set them up in front of cohorts of Asian citrus psyllid nymphs. This is Erica Kissner, a postdoc who did this work in our lab. And these um, Pi cameras were outfitted with infrared LEDs, so we could basically record activity on those groups or clusters of Asian citrus psyllid nymphs 24 hours a day, seven days a week for several weeks in a, in a row. 
So what did we find from all this videography data? Well, we had a lot of video to go through, 19,200 hours. It was basically a, almost a full-time job for about six undergraduates for the better part of eight to nine months, just going through all of that video. But the data were excellent. We had 647 confirmed kill events. Almost 60% of them were by these hoverfly larvae, which we had never seen in the citrus orchards before. And I'll come back to that in a minute. About 30% of the kills were, were from Tamarixia radiata, our parasitoid. What was even more interesting than that was that this parasitoid appears to be, you know, we, we joke, it's, it's quite lazy. It shows up on the video exactly at like 10 o'clock in the morning. It works until one o'clock in the afternoon, and then it disappears for the rest of the day. We, we don't see it. We don't know where it goes. And we don't know what it's doing. And then about 12% or so of the events were from predation by lacewing larvae. And we figured that lacewing larvae would be a very important predator in California's citrus system, but it isn't. No observations of spiders, no observations of ladybugs or coccinellids attacking Asian citrus psyllid nymphs. To come back to the hoverfly larva, the videos showed us that these guys do most of their feeding at nighttime. They're nocturnal, and that's why we had never seen them before. So at nighttime, we have the hoverfly larvae feeding on Asian citrus nymphs, and then during the daytime, we have Tamarixia radiata going after any survivors that they can find. But the video data also showed us that Argentine ants were almost always present on those cohorts of Asian citrus psyllid when they could access them. And as a result of their presence, they often chased away the natural enemies. And the reason they do this is that they harvest the honeydew, that white material, and they take it back to the nest to feed the brood and the queen. And as a consequence of this harvesting of honeydew, they protect their lives, their micro livestock, Asian citrus psyllid nymphs, mealybugs, aphids, white flies, and other honeydew producing pests from their natural enemies. So it became obvious to us that we needed to do something about these ants. About 90% of our study sites are infested with Argentine ants. Some of our count data suggests that the activity of ants in these trees is very high, maybe up to a million visits per day. And about 90% of those sat feeding pest colonies are tended by Argentine ants. And this is what happens when the Argentine ants find Tamarixia radiata. They come in, basically kill off our natural enemies, take those little snacks back to the nest and feed them to the brood and the queens. This is what, we don't want to be seeing this in the field. And I've seen it numerous times and it's very disheartening. So right, the next step is we're going to kill those ants. So how can we improve biological control of these citrus pests when Argentine ants are present? We've done several things. The first thing that we did was working with um, chemical engineers here at UCR, we developed these biodegradable hydrogel beads. They're small like boba balls. They're made out of uh, alginate that you can buy on the internet. There's even videos available of kids making little gummy worms and other cool things with, with these gels. So we can make these gels, ball-like little beads, soak them in a 25% sucrose solution, which is the sugar water that the ants love, and in that, we put a very low concentration of insecticide, about a 0.0001% concentration of either thymethoxan or a 0.001% concentration of organically approved spinosad. This photo shows the ants feeding on those uh, uh, hydrogel beads, and they're drawing the sugar water out of it, out of them, and then they take it back to the nest to feed the queen and the brood. Then within about two to three days, the colonies collapse there'll be some rebounding. So every two to three weeks, we go out and replenish these hydrogel beads in the areas of the orchards where there's a lot of ant activity. Then after about three or four successive applications, you're pretty much taking care of the ant population for the rest of the season. Now, the, the trick is, if you're dealing with citrus orchards that could be 10, 20, 100 acres or more in size, and they're infested with Argentine ants, the ants aren't uniformly distributed through these orchards. So you just don't want to be putting gels out all over the place because a lot of your material may not be even found by the ants and you're wasting product and you're wasting time and you're wasting money. Can we come up with a system where we can get machines to count and find the ants for us? We don't have to put any humans in the orchards to go out scouting. 
it is possible to do this. And I was talking to some engineers, computer engineers, about this idea of, you know, could we make like a, a system that we could attach to irrigation pipes and citrus orchards? If ants are present, they're always running along those irrigation lines, the half or three quarter inch polyethylene pipe that runs along the ground. The ants use them because they're long and linear, they're smooth, and it facilitates rapid movement from their subterranean nests along the pipes to the tree trunks, up to the tree trunks, get all your food, come back down again, get on the superhighway and run back to the nest. If you ever want to know where ants are and how intense the activity is, look at those irrigation lines. So the engineers go, oh yeah, that's really simple. You know, actually we'll put an undergraduate on that program and they'll build an infrared sensor for you to count ants as they're running along the pipes. And this is what we ended up building. These infrared sensors that put a beam across the pipe, they're held onto the pipe with these special 3D printed clamps. And in the box here sits the brain of the sensor. So every hour on the hour for one minute, the sensors turn themselves on and they count all the ants that are running back. Then they go into hibernation. Then they wake up again, go into hibernation. They do this 24 times a day. And then at the end of the day, they all turn themselves on and then they connect to something that we call a gateway, which is in the orchard. So all the sensors connect to the gateway. The gateway pulls in all the data from those sensors and then sends it over the cellular networks to the cloud. And we have an Amazon site and working with the computer engineers, they developed an app which provides summary data that you can access on your phone, tablet, or even on your desktop computer. And you can look at heat maps through the orchard to see where ants are most active. So the idea is you go in and place those gels in areas of the orchard where the heat maps are red. You don't want to be putting gels in parts of the orchards where it's green and blue because there's not a lot of ant activity going on in those areas. These sensors are all GPS tagged. They can be outfitted with temperature and humidity sensors so they can provide an immense amount of data for um, nerds like us who like to see what's going on in these orchards at, at, at a very granular level. Okay, so we've got something to count the ants and we know where to put the gels. We can put the gels out and kill the ants, but what can we do to boost natural enemy activity in these orchards? These orchards are essentially barren. There's nothing growing underneath the trees. And we know that our surfed flies, for example, the adult females, they need pollen from flowers to give them protein to make eggs. They also need to take nectar from flowers to give them the sugars that they need to fly. So we've assessed cover crops in citrus orchards, and we've identified one that's very attractive towards uh, for the hoverflies. This is a lysum. It's well adapted to California's climate because this is a plant that's native to the Mediterranean. And our field work has clearly demonstrated that if you plant small patches of alyssum through these orchards, pest colonies that are in close proximity to those flower patches suffer very high levels of mortality in comparison to similar paired control areas where we do not have flower resources available for the hoverflies. The final thing we've been looking at are cultural control practices. And the idea here is, can we disrupt the use of those pipes by Argentine ants so they can't run along them as fast? And you've all experienced speed bumps on the road. And they're extremely annoying when you're going at high speed and you've got to slam on the brakes because you don't see them. And you've got to go over them slowly and you take off again. Well, we were thinking maybe we could put speed bumps on these irrigation lines to slow down ant activity. Therefore, we could create space in the canopy of the trees because there's not so many ants and they're not coming up as frequently or as fast. And this could give natural enemies more time to control some of those pests and reduce our reliance on insecticides. So we've built these, um, made on the 3D printer, uh, these speed barriers. So the ants come racing along here, they hit the bump, it takes them some time to get up over the top and then they drop into this cavity here, which is longer than their body width, so they can't step over. And then each of those rings has a rim that faces inwards. So then they become trapped in this rim and they just walk around in circles over and over and over and over again. Well, this behavior may go on for a couple of days or so, but then the ants are pretty smart. They figure out, well, okay, speed bump, just like we do. Time to get off the road and drive along the emergency lane <laughs> and then get back on the road again once you pass the speed bumps. So 
we are now looking at maybe using the system in vineyards where the irrigation line is suspended on the trellising and the ants can't easily get off those um, highways and walk along the ground. That's the next phase of this work. Okay, so some take home messages. Our field evaluations over several years, many sites have clearly shown that there's been a massive decline in Asian citrus psyllidums, more than 70% in Southern California. 11 years on now, after the initial de detection of the bacteria that causes Huang Long Bing in LA County, we've seen no massive HLB outbreaks in California. There's nothing similar, not even close to what happened in Florida is occurring here in California at this time. We think that this is in part due to the vector densities being so low. You know, a lot of the literature you read and all the computer models say, if you can take vector densities to low levels, disease incidence drops, and then disease severity is not such a big problem. I think we've achieved that with our biocontrol program. And as I mentioned, some of the CDFA monitoring sites have been ACP free now for more than two years, and they're going to discontinue, or well, they're considering discontinuing these program monitoring programs. We'll also state emphatically that the biological control agents from Pakistan and the resident natural enemies have achieved far greater levels of suppression of ACP over much vaster areas, far more cheaply and sustainably than was ever possible with the spray programs that were being run by the USDA and the CDFA. Consequently, because of such low vector densities, out of the tens of millions of citrus trees that grow in people's backyards here in urban Southern California, only about 6,000 have died from HLB. That is a minuscule fraction of 1%. Again, further supporting this idea that there's going to be no massive wave of HLB or a huge epidemic of this disease racing through the urban and commercial citrus landscapes in Southern California. So natural enemies have killed more ACP than other, any other management program. Our two key natural enemies are here, Tamarixia radiata, which is diurnal, and then the surfed fly larvae, which operate at nighttime. These agents are working for us 24-7, 365 days of the year. And as we mentioned, the ants, we're trying to make these impacts even greater by eliminating the disruptive effects that Argentine ants have by protecting sap-sucking pests from these natural enemies. Love if you'd like more in uh, information on our Argentine ant program, please scan this. I'll leave it up for five seconds if you want it. Excuse me. One, two, three. Four, five. Okay, right, time to move on. And now I'd like to share with you um, this beautiful KQED video that summarizes a lot of the work that we have just presented. Can you hear that, Glenn? Yes. Okay, great. This orchard is swarming with Argentine ants, but they're not here for the juicy oranges. They found something way better. They're obsessed with these delicate candy ribbons, which happen to be coming out of the butts of these tiny insects, Asian citrus psyllids. They suck sap from citrus trees and produce the prettiest of poops called honeydew. The ants ranch the psyllids like cattle, putting their lives on the line to protect their herd from predators. This ladybug larva is easily deterred, but this hoverfly larva takes more convincing. Even more dangerous to psyllids is this tiny parasitoid wasp. It's looking for a host for its eggs. But the ants are having none of that. The psyllids and their ant allies have an even bigger threat. Citrus growers who are desperate to keep the pests out of their orchards. That's because psyllids can spread bacteria in their saliva that causes a disease called citrus greening. The disease turns leaves yellow, 
and makes fruit green and bitter. Citrus growers can spray pesticides, but those kill the helpful insects too, leaving the trees undefended when the psyllids inevitably find their way back. Plus, spraying only gets at some of the ants, since most are safely underground at any one time. So let's recap. It's psyllids and their ant bodyguards versus citrus growers, predators, and parasites. Still with me? Because psyllids are so tough to get at, citrus growers decided to take out their ant accomplices instead. By studying the ant's behavior, researchers at the University of California, Riverside, found a weakness they could exploit. Ants follow the easiest path from tree to tree. They're all about efficiency. They turn the orchard's irrigation pipes into mini highways. Researchers set up sensors on the pipes that use invisible infrared beams to measure how many ants go marching through. In the most trafficked areas, researchers spread these tiny biodegradable balls. They're soaked in sugar water, laced with a slow-acting insecticide. The ants slurp up the poison and bring it back to share with the colony. This targeted technique uses just a fraction of the pesticide that spraying would. With fewer of their bodyguards around, the psyllids are more exposed to their enemies. The parasitoid wasp moves right on in. And lays an egg on the psyllid's soft underside. That wasp egg hatches, and the larva, right here, burrows into the psyllid, devouring it from the inside. When the wasp is all grown up, it chews its way out, right through the top of the dead psyllid. Glad they're on our side, huh? It's a story of unlikely allies, fighting an ongoing battle for the sweetest of rewards. Okay, so that's a very cool video. We spent, uh, you know, a very long week with KQED making that for like four minutes. <laughs> but they did a stellar job putting it together. All right, so that was a successful program, I think, that we've run against Asian citrus psyllid. And we're going to change gears now, and we'll, I'm going to provide you updates on the South American palm weevil invasion into Southern California. This insect is proving a little more difficult to manage at this time, and it presents an unprecedented threat to California's date industries and probably by extension to the date growing communities out in the Bard Valley in Southern Arizona as well. So this whole story started around 2010. And in 2010, we were fighting a palm weevil invasion into Laguna Beach in Orange County in Southern California. It's a small wealthy enclave. There are no airports, no seaports there. How this strange palm weevil that was black with a red stripe came to Laguna Beach. We really don't know how it got there, but it was killing the palm trees. And once we started that program, I got a call from a guy I know down in Tijuana, Cristobal. He called me up. He goes, um, you know what? I think that palm weevil from Laguna is now here in Tijuana and it's killing our palm trees too. And here it is, dead palm trees. So I said, oh my God, that's amazing. How did it get from Laguna to Tijuana? He says, you got to come down and have a look. And I said, right, I'm coming down to have a look. So we went down, climbed up into the tops of these palms. We found these black weevils, completely black, which looked nothing like the weevil that we were dealing with in Laguna Beach, which was black with a red stripe. It's like, ah, oh, okay, right, there's something, something odd going on here. So the USDA identified this red-striped palm weevil as this insect, the notorious red palm weevil, which has killed millions of palm trees in the Middle East, all through the northern parts of Africa, and it's a serious problem in the Mediterranean region where it's killed many, many, many Canary Island date palms as well. So these weevils all look very, very different from, from each other. So this is what we were dealing with in Laguna Beach. Black weevil with a red stripe. 
DNA work eventually indicated that this species was Rhynchophorus vulneratus, the red striped palm weevil from Indonesia. Specifically, our invading population looked like it came from Bali, an island that has a very high uh, level of, of tourism. The USDA confused this red striped weevil with the red palm weevil shown here, and currently they have refused to acknowledge that these two insects are different morphologically, and they have very distinct genetic fingerprints as well. So as far as USDA is concerned, this red striped weevil that was, that was in Laguna Beach is still technically classified by them as red palm weevil, which is incorrect. And then we have this guy, the black weevil, which we had identified and has been identified correctly as the South American palm weevil. So we eradicated this red striped weevil, and we are currently dealing with the South American palm weevil invasion into Southern California. So the red striped palm weevil was declared eradicated by USDA on the 20th of January 2015. But while we were dealing with this invasion of the red striped weevil, there were not enough resources in terms of money and manpower to deal with the South American palm weevil populations that were just flying in to southern San Diego County from those infested palm trees down in, down in Tijuana. So how do these weevils kill palm trees? Well, these weevils have long snouts and the females use that snout nose rostrum to drill a hole into the top of the palm tree and they lay their eggs, which are quite large in that hole and those grubs that hatch out of those eggs, the larvae, drill their way down into the apical meristematic area of the palm. This is the palm heart that sits at the top of the trunk and it's from that central area that all the new fronds grow up. Once that is heavily damaged, the palm often dies. And palm weevil larvae are extremely efficient at killing that palm frond producing area in Canary Island date palms and other palm trees as well. So once they've finished feeding and they've gone through their larval instars, they will then leave that palm heart area. They will move to the bases of the fronds that are still attached to the tree. They will then drill tunnels, make these pupation chambers in the bases of those fronds. Then they will gather the palm fibers that are dangling around them and wrap them around their bodies to form these very tight cocoons. Let me put my laser pointer back on. This photograph here shows a cocoon that I've popped open, cracked open. Very hard to do it. They're extremely tightly woven. And this shows a pre-pupil larva that has just finished making its cocoon. So this larva will molt, shed its skin, undergo ecdysis, and develop these wing pads. And all this is happening within the protective cocoon, kind of like a butterfly going under metamorphosis. The weevil larvae do the same thing. After metamorphosis, they then emerge from those cocoons and you have these adult weevils that have legs that allow them to walk and they have wings which allow them to fly and they're strong flyers. The adult looks nothing like the grub. The grub is basically a mouth and a stomach and all it does is feed. The adult stage is, can disperse and reproduce. So they've sort of divided up their life, uh, life habitats here. It's very easy to sex palm weevils. If you look at the rostrum or the snout, the males always have these stout bristles on the top of the nose, top of the rostrum. Females lack those bristles. So their nose or their snout or their rostrum is very smooth. So easy to sex them. You pick them up, you hold them up to the light, you look for those bristles. Male, if they're present, no bristles because it's all smooth, that's a female. Here's some of the external damage that is very obvious. So if you suspect the palm may be attacked and you see these basal sheaths have drooped down from the trunk or maybe they've even broken off and fallen on the ground, if they have the Swiss cheese looking appearance, this is evidence that the larvae have then left the meristematic area, the palm heart, the crown area, and have pushed their way through the basal fronds into the bases of these palm fronds where they make these pupation tunnels and chambers within which they pupate. If you then get up into the remaining meristematic area, the palm heart, you'll see that the weevil larvae here have basically turned that area into a, a rancid oatmeal-like mash. It's very warm and it has a very distinctive odor. And often it is extremely wet. The weevil larvae will basically eat out that meristematic region. They will not drill their way down through the trunk. They basically excavate a bowl at the top of the palm tree. And as the palm is pulling up all this water, that bowl fills up with water. And amazingly, they don't drown. They're incredibly water resistant. That is just one thing that amazes me about these larvae and the adults. They seem immune to drowning. They can like swim around and float, and they seem to do quite fine. 
So here are examples of palm trees in San Diego County. This is the Glen Abbey Cemetery near Bonita, which is close to Chula Vista in San Diego County. And you can see all stages of palm mortality here. These trunks were killed by the palm weevil a while ago and all the fronds have fallen out. This palm is obviously completely dead and the fronds are in the stages of dropping out. This green palm here has collapsed. The crown has dropped off it, but the fronds that are basically encircling the top of that, that trunk, sort of like a green halo, are still attached. They haven't dried up, turned brown, and fallen off. And here's a healthy-looking Canary Island date palm with strong fronds still coming up from the uh, central region here. So this suggests that this palm is either not infested or it's at the very early stages of infestation. But subsequently, this palm tree has died too. So it was probably infested when I took this photo. Excuse me. So those dead fronds produce a significant dropping hazard. Wind storm events will cause them to fall to the ground, damaging fences, possibly falling on the roofs of cars. Those fronds have these long spikes, which are easily go through your shoes and present a, a hazard to people, children, and pets. Okay, so how many palms have been killed in San Diego County? Well, industry estimates suggest that more than 20,000 of these Canary Island date palms have now been killed by South American palm weevil attacks since it first established in San Diego sometime around 2014, 2015. Uh, we've been doing a, a six monthly driving survey inspecting the survivorship rates of 521 urban palms that are around the uh, Chula Vista Bonita area, the epicenter for the infestation that we are following. So when we started this survey in August of 2016, our 521 palms looked perfectly healthy. Seven years later, in August 2023, about 67% of those palms have been killed over the seven-year period. That's more than 350 of them at a cost of about $1,500 to $10,000 to remove, depending on how difficult access is to those palms. So a significant economic impact on the homeowners. So the other thing about this, uh, about this weevil, which is problematic, is that it spreads a palm killing pathogen called the red ring nematode. As you can see, its common name comes from this red ring, which forms a circular pattern inside the, the coconut palm, which we cut up here. I don't know why it's red. I don't know why it's circular. And uh, nematologists that I've talked to and plant pathologists have been unable to explain this peculiarity to me either. But the weevils can carry these nematodes inside their bodies. So when they lay eggs or if they defecate in the palm tree, they can release the nematodes. Or the nematodes could be hanging onto the body of the weevil. So when it gets to a palm tree, they drop off and the infection with the nematodes begins. So these palms can die within about six to 20 weeks of being infected with, with nematodes. So even if you're able to protect your tree from weevil attack with insecticides, if the nematode is introduced into the palm, the palm will still die because a lot of those insecticides have no nematicidal activity. So about 10 years ago, the CDFA dissected about 111 field court weevils and determined that none of them had red ring nematode associated with them. I have about 8,000 weevils in the freezer here right now, being collected over almost a 10-year period. You know, there could be red ring nematode in some of those specimens. We don't know. And that's probably something we need to go back and look at to determine whether or not that pathogen is here in California. So another question that we have answered is, you know, can these palm weevils fly? And yes, there are very strong flies. We hooked them up to these flight mills, which are essentially merry-go-rounds. And each revolution is about one meter or one yard or so. And the computer can record how far these weevils fly, how fast they fly, how often do they fly? Is there a difference between male and female weevils? What about young versus old weevils, mated versus unmated, starved versus fed? So we've been able to look at a lot of different variables to see what effects they have on in, of weevil flight. But look, look, I mean, this is completely artificial. They're in a perfect room, perfect temperature, and they fly around in circles. So how useful these data are for explaining what we observe in the field, mm, it's hard to say. But either way, the data are very interesting. On average, these weevils can fly about 25 miles in a 24-hour period. We had one female that flew 93 miles in a 24-hour period. What these data suggest to me is that males and females are pretty strong flyers, and within the population, we potentially have what I call super dispersers, about 10% of them can fly extraordinarily long distances. 
And it may be these weevils that are leaving San Diego that we're picking up in places like Palm Desert, for example, or in even in trapping in southern Arizona, palm weevils have shown up, even though there are no known established populations. Palm weevils have, the South American palm weevil has even been detected in southern Texas, even though there's no known populations established in those areas. How are they getting there? Where are they coming from? We don't know, but they are strong flyers, and maybe all they need to do is just keep flying, feed on an apple or some mature fruit like figs that we have in our yards here. Palm weevils will come and feed on those. That gives them enough sugar, and off they fly again, looking for susceptible palm hosts. We've been running trapping studies over a six and a half year period at the Sweetwater Reserve in Bonita. This is a riparian area that has thousands of naturalized Canary Island date palms. And to monitor those weevil numbers, we hang these bucket traps. The bucket traps are loaded with fermenting bait. We use dates, water, and baker's yeast, and we attach to the lid the commercially available aggregation pheromone. The weevils are attracted by the combination of odors from the pheromone and the fermenting bait. They fly to the bucket, walk up the burlap, drop in the holes, and then they drown in the antifreeze that we keep in the solution here. Every month I go out, count the weevils, clear the traps, and reset them. This graph shows two different data sets. The orange line here are the percentage of females that we catch. The males produce the aggregation pheromone. And on average, we're catching about 66% females in the traps and about 33% males. I really like the aggregation pheromone because it's attractive to both sexes, but it's particularly potent against females. A lot of the pheromones we often use are sex pheromones. They're released by the females and they only attract males. This pheromone gets both sexes. The green bars that you show here are the monthly total counts of weevils that we capture in those traps over time. You can see that those numbers go up and down over time, and then that the intensity or the numbers of weevils that we catch is also highly variable over time. The last year we did the monitoring was the highest levels of weevils that we had ever captured compared to the preceding five years when I would have thought weevil densities would have been at their highest because palm trees have just continually been killed in, in the Sweetwater Reserve. So what these data show us is that weevils fly year round, but their flight activity is highly seasonal. And we can summarize that in the following graph. So most of the weevil flight activity occurs between April and October. We collect about 80% of our weevils in the traps over <clears> this time. Between November and March, weevil flight activity is relatively low, and we think this might be a good time to initiate palm management strategies. So if you want to do pruning, for example, which will release volatiles that weevils find very attractive, you might want to consider doing that over the winter of very, very early spring when weevil flight activity is low and they will not be able to respond as strongly to the smell of volatiles coming from cut palm trees. Traps are important. The bucket trap that we used at Sweetwater basically sucks as a trap for catching weevils in comparison to the Pacusan trap. So the Pacusan trap shown here is a pyramidal trap that we set on the ground. It's basically an inverted cone. You still load it with fermenting bait and aggregation pheromone. The weevils land on the ground. They walk up the black sides here and drop in the top. And once they're in the top, they can't get out because the top of the trap is invaginated. So using videography studies that we did, the reason that the bucket trap only catches about 30% weevils that come to it as opposed to more than 95% of the weevils that come to the Pacusan trap is that the weevils go in and out of these holes and they walk around. They can do this for hours. And if they don't fall in the antifreeze, they just end up flying away. So we are recommending that trapping programs use these Pacusan traps. They catch more weevils and the retention rates are far superior to the primitive bucket trap that we have been using. So how can you protect your palms from weevil attack? Insecticides are definitely the best method of, of protecting your palms. You can either drench the crown, you can do soil injections for the roots to take up uh, systemic products, trunk injections, also work, but they're not recommended because you make a hole in the trunk of a palm tree and it won't, won't recover. Contact insecticides are used to spray the crown region and they leave lethal residues that kill adult weevils. So we've done trials with commercial companies. Dinotefuran bark sprays and soil injections are, are effective at protecting palms. Dinotefuran is a soil injection and imidacloprid applied as a crown spray is also effective. Dinotefuran and imidacloprid applied as soil injections are effective. And imamectin benzoate, injected into the trunk. It's not very good. At, I don't think it can be taken up through the soil. It certainly doesn't work as a trunk paint. It's not mobile enough. But 
The injection sites are important. You need at least four, I think, probably for really good uptake. And these holes need to be quite deep into the trunk, about six to seven inches. The other thing about emamectin benzoate that I like, not only does it give weevil killing activity, but there's a lot of literature to suggest that it's also effective against nematodes. So if red ring nematode shows up, emamectin benzoate may be able to protect your palms from weevils and red ring nematode. But then if you overuse this, we're going to end up with resistance problems. Okay, what are we now doing about the palm weevil invasion into Southern California? This weevil poses a major threat to the edible date industry in the Coachella Valley. At this time, weevil populations are confined to urban areas of San Diego County. We are working on monitoring and control tools while the weevil is in the urban area. We're being very proactive on this. We're trying to come up with management solutions and monitoring plans before the weevil gets into these edible date production areas. We don't want to be wasting time doing all this work when the inevitable invasion has happened. We're doing it ahead of time. So the Coachella Valley edible date industry is worth about 100 million a year, 10,000 acres or so, and approximately 6,000 employees in a part of Southern California where jobs are not plentiful. The weevil could potentially threaten these statistics. There's limited control options for the date industry. They don't have a lot of insecticides registered. I'm not sure what the situation is in, a in Arizona. It may be similar to, to California. Beginning in April 2024, I'm beginning a preliminary uh, project assessing the biocontrol potential for South American palm weevil. There is a parasitic fly in Brazil, which can kill up to about 70% of palm weevil larvae in palms, especially in oil palm plantations in Brazil. I'm very interested in knowing whether or not this fly can be bred in captivity. And that's going to be a key thing that we're going to be looking at. I've had an undergraduate, Gabby San Jose, who's just finished her time in our lab. She's actually going to go to Brazil to work with my friend George Torres down there. And her master's program is going to be looking at this fly as a potential biological control agent for South American palm wheels. So I'm very optimistic about this project. The other thing that we're now running in um, San Diego County is that we received a large grant from the CDFA's Office of Pesticide Consultation and Analysis, their proactive IPM and biological control yes. solutions program, where we are looking at a tract and kill for suppressing these weevils. And a tract and kill is very elegant. There's a company that makes these dollops, splat, which is an inert waxy matrix. And in that dollop is infused a small amount of insecticide, about 5% cepamethrin, and the aggregation pheromone. You put out the dollops, the weevils smell the pheromone, they're attracted to it, they're curious, they walk over it, they get a lethal dose of insecticide, and they die. We've used our videography system to assess this. The weevils only need to contact the dollop for around three seconds, and that's enough to result in mortality. Even more interesting, if a male walks over that dollop and gets a dose, and then he tries mating with a female that does not walk over the dollop, he ends up killing her because he's transferred the poison to her as well. We refer to this as horizontal transfer. So that's another interesting outcome of these videography studies that, that we have done. Okay, we suspect that the palm weevils will probably establish in urban areas like Palm Desert or even Palm Springs in the Coachella Valley, probably on Canary Island date palms. And from there, they will push into the date production areas. Work out of, April, uh, out of Israel in the Middle East strongly shows that date production areas are extremely vulnerable to palm weevil invasion and the establishment of populations when neighboring urban areas have Canary Island date palms, which are by far the preferred host for this weevil, far greater than any other palm species that we have looked at. But when the weevils are pressed for food, if there's only date palms available, they will use those date palms for food and reproduction. If you'd like to know more about our palm weevil program, please scan this. I'll give you five seconds, and then we'll watch another beautiful little video made by KQED. Do I have time, Glenn, for the video? Yeah, you've got seven minutes. Okay, great. We're going to be right on schedule. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, let's go to the video. Let me uh, turn off my laser pointer. Ah, Southern California. You know, the whole surf's up, tinsel town, sun soaked glamour thing? 
Too bad this idyllic landscape is mostly make-believe. Take the palm trees. They're not even real trees. They're more closely related to grass. And they're imported. Like this Canary Island date palm. It came halfway around the world to be one of the more dazzling stars in the landscape. But this Hollywood success story is turning into a horror movie. This little monster is the South American palm weevil. Scientists first found it in San Diego in 2011. Weevils are just beetles with snouts. This female uses hers as a drill to get at the palm's apical meristem. It's a bowl of juicy goodness at the top where the leaves sprout. She lays her eggs down in those tunnels or spawn eat the palm from the inside out, starting with its heart. That's right, it's the same stuff you can get at a supermarket. They'll turn this palm's healthy flesh into a rotting mess that smells like a dumpster in the sun. Once they're big enough, the larvae will spin cigar-shaped cocoons from the leftover fibers they can't eat. As the trees frond, starve, and die, the larvae hang out and gestate, morphing into pupae and... Ew, that's just... Oh man, that's gross. As adults, they burst out, take flight, and seek out a new host leaving behind the dying hollow shell of a once majestic palm. Mark Hoddle at UC Riverside is tracking the weevil infestation. He puts them on a kind of aerial treadmill in his lab to test their stamina. He's trying to figure out how they got here, whether they hitched a ride on imported palms or made the trip themselves. Turns out they can fly up to 15 miles a day, enough to hopscotch from palm to palm on their own. The only way to stop them? Treat every palm tree in their path with pesticides before the weevils get there. That'll be tough to do. So these particular botanical icons could be on the fast track to being just another Hollywood has-been. These weevils are pretty gnarly. So we asked Anna Rothschild from Gross Science to do those animations for us. Thanks, Anna. You're welcome. It's my pleasure. I love gross stuff. So there is one other way to manage these larvae. Sort of just a- Just wait for it. Just wait for it. ...in some places like Thailand, Peru, and Ghana. So hop over to my channel and we'll episode about it. And thanks for watching this deep look. Obviously, Mark survived that. <laughs> say, that's him. He was happy. He was happy. He was happy. That's right. Yeah. So they're actually pretty tasty. Uh, yeah. And uh, we've eaten them in a lot of countries. Uh, stir fried in Thailand. They're very good. There's actually commercial palm weevil farms in Thailand where you can go buy them by the kilo, the larvae by the kilo. Uh, we've eaten them in Sumatra. Where we've taken them out of the palm trees, neat the palms directly. And, uh, you know, um, blanched with the heads removed and then deep fried. If I was to pass that bowl of those around, you'd swear you're eating calamari and they are really good. But I really like the pupae. Those are very rich in fats and it's like having a, 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 a lump of butter in your mouth. Uh, they're really actually pretty good. Maybe that's how maybe that's how they got to Laguna Beach <laughs> as an appetizer for somebody. Yeah, so that's uh, something that we pursued. Actually, was we thought that uh, we looked at the census, um, you know, census data for that area, and um, it, that was one of the hypotheses we were working on that they had been deliberately smuggled in to set up like a, a local indigenous, you know, traditional food 
that you can't easily get in California. And that's probably how they got to Laguna, maybe how they got to Laguna. So we actually set up a Facebook page asking people if they knew where we could buy palm weevil larvae, but nobody responded to those requests. <laughs> All right. Very good. Thank you, Mark. Any questions? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, there's a question. Go ahead. Okay. Do, do the ants or the surfeit fly larvae uh, interact with the citrus thrips at all? Ah, uh, yeah, no, we've got no evidence for that. Yeah, those thrips are pretty small, very secretive, often up underneath the sepals of, of the fruit. So, yeah, we've seen no evidence of that, but we weren't really, really looking. And I don't think, I'm not really aware of ants forming any type of mutualism with, with thrips. At least in our citrus orchards, I, sh I should say, yeah. Is it only the Argentine ant that does that, or the other ant species that do that? Yeah, so for us in Southern California, Argentine ant is our major problem, but we've also worked with David Haviland in the southern uh, in the Central Valley, and they have gray field ant up there, which is a native ant. It, it also is a honeydew um, feeding ant. It doesn't form strong trails like Argentine ant. But he's also used those hydrogel beads as a control strategy for taking out gray field ants as well. Once they find the sugar water, they go back and forth and they'll take it to the nest and poison themselves. Yeah, it's a beautiful system. We don't have to do anything. They'll kill themselves. <laughs> Are those gels available uh, in a commercial market? Yeah, so they're not commercially available. Um, this is all boutique scientific work and um, what we have been trying to do is convince the California Department of Pesticide Regulations which ironically enough supported the development and field testing of these gels as an alternative to chlorpyrifos but at the same time their interpretation of the use of these gels and the insecticides based on their interpretation of the legislation at this stage is a major barrier to their adoption so uh, it, it's the irony there is 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 really quite something. We might be able to do it in Arizona. <laughs> there we yes. Are. Yeah. So the way some of these Californian guys have got around it is that they've basically gone straight to their um, county ag commissioner, explained the situation to them. And if the ag commissioner gave them permission, it seems like DPR is sort of like willing to sort of maybe not be so aggressive on the interpretation of whether or not you can use these gels. Yeah. Would you mind sending me a, an email with the, uh, with a couple of links on how to make these gels? So yeah, that I, I, yeah, I can send you the papers and it's yeah. very straightforward to do. And there's lots of YouTube tutorials on, on this stuff as well. Yeah. All right, I should hand it over to over to Bodle. I don't want to chew Very up good. your time. Thanks. All my right, question, thank you. My, my question on that. Oh, yeah, sure. My question on that gel thing was... Uh, I have micro sprinklers on my citrus, and my biggest problem for micro sprinkler clogging is ants. Yeah. So I'm trying to use other poisons to get rid of them, and that gel kind of caught my eye. Yeah. So that's been a problem for our growers too, is ants getting into those sprinkler heads and, and clogging them up. Uh, just to extend that a little bit further, you know, those 3D printed barriers that we're putting on the pipes? One of the ultimate insults that we received in the field one week were the ants turning those structures into above ground nesting <laughs> sites. <laughs> so they are pretty opportunistic. So, yeah. But once you kill them with the gels, now I tell you, those gels are really great at taking out the ants. They're very effective. And there's no maintenance. Put the gels out <laughs> and you're done. They biodegrade into the soil. You're not looking after plastic ant bait stations, which are costly to buy and take a ton of work to maintain. All right. Let's turn it over to Bodle. Thank yeah, you, everybody. Thank you. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you. Great. I, thanks. Good morning. Great. Thank you. Um, I'm really happy to um, connect with you all today. Um, I'm sorry I couldn't be there in person. I'll actually be um, coming through Arizona uh, in a couple of days, and I, I couldn't shift the travel schedule but um next time i'll i'll be there um so uh yeah i've just started um this this was my first semester on campus at riverside um and it's a joint position with the um ag and natural resources um and i'm i'm based on on campus at riverside um so this i'm i'm just getting set up this is my um 
website address that's not live yet, but it will be soon, and my contact information. Um, I wasn't sure how well I come on, on the screen, so I just put a photo of myself here. This is at um, the Ag Ops um, field site on, on campus. Uh, and you can hear me okay? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, and you can can you see the pointer? Yes. yes. Okay, great. I haven't used that before, but I just worked it out. Um, so I'm going to talk this morning about um, an eco-informatics approach to IPM for subtropical fruit crops, um, sort of as an example of this methodology we've been using. Um, just a, um, a bit of my background. How do I move the slide? No. Okay, um, so I, um, I'm really happy to see the U of A symbol in the background there. I did my PhD um, with Molly Hunter in the Department of Entomology in Tucson. Um, so I'm really happy to be uh, back connecting with this group. I, I was in um, at the U of A for seven years. I, I loved it there. I love this whole area. Um, collected white flies at the, the MAC um, research station um, nearby where you are this morning. Um, and then uh, I, um, the work I'm going to talk about this morning um, was from my postdoctoral research that was at UC Davis with Jay Rosenheim and Beth Grafton Cardwell. And that was focused on citrus um, IPM for in the Central Valley area. So um, some are different pests that that are in your area, but um, I'll just uh, pre present some of that as an example of, of my research approach. Um, and then most recently, I was in San Diego at the Department of Agriculture there, um, working on insect identification for their um, invasive pest program. Um, so we were really grateful for um, Mark Hoddle's work that he just talked about for the palm weevil, because that um, is really the the insect we were getting the most calls about. We'd get two or three calls a week about palm weevil in San Diego. So really great that they've got more funding to work on that issue. Um, okay, so I'm going to talk. Oh, uh, oh, so my um, new position at um, Riverside um, is it's the subtropical fruit, so not just citrus, also avocado and dates, um, improving the pest management of arthropods in specialty fruit crops and subtropical crops in California. So our lab manager, Timo Rahula, um, if you call the lab phone, you might get through to him. Um, he stayed on from Monique Rivera's lab. Um, and has, has done a lot of the Asian citrus psyllid sampling um, work that we're going to be continuing. Um, and right now, I'm um, you know I'm getting set up, getting the the lab operational, and um, connecting with everyone and seeing what are the most urgent research questions, what's the most important research areas. Um, so really, my goal this morning is to introduce myself and invite you to connect with me. I really want to hear from um, growers and PCAs and other researchers, like what are the research directions that we should be focusing on and, and setting up um, as we move uh, move this sort of research forward. Um, so I'll talk this morning, just an example of the research approach that I've used before in Davis and, and um, and at the U of A with white flies and what I um, plan to continue with this, this approach and talk about some of our um, plans in citrus and dates. Okay, so the example I'm going to use is for katydids and mandarins in the Central Valley. And what we were looking at there or the sort of challenge that we were um, trying to address is that we have this year-round IPM program that's um, real has been really effective. It was established from decades of, of experience and field experiments in oranges. But now there's all this new mandarin acreage. Um, everyone's you know this, everyone wants to buy the the little um, lunchbox mandarins. <laughs> so these mandarins are now half of the new citrus acreage and and a quarter of the the, the statewide citrus acreage. But we don't know anything about pest management in mandarins. Um, we so our 
goal was to to look at uh, the IPM management, like the IPM that we're using in oranges, is it effective in mandarins or do we need to be doing something different? And if if you've walked through a field of oranges and mandarins, they're quite different architecturally. Um, it's they're actually different, you know, species of of citrus of, of plants. Um, we sort of you can group them broadly. So, you know, I mean, that citrus uh, systematics taxonomy is complicated, but in in general, sits the sweet oranges, navels, valencias, they're citrus sinensis. And then the mandarins, or what's marketed as a mandarin, is um, citrus reticulata. They're the, the true mandarins, so the tangos, the mercots, the aphoras. And then um, the clementines, citrus clementina, satsumas and tangelos are different again. So there's a lot of like um, host plant genetic diversity in mandarins, and they're different from oranges. So it's a, a tricky question to try and get at. Like it's it's decades of of work to work out the the pest management strategies for oranges. We were like, where do we even start with this question in mandarins? Like how like there's so many pests. Like it's how do we approach this question? And so what we decided to do was use a, um, a big data or data mining or eco-informatics approach. So if you're following your questions, this is the first question. Eco-informatics is the analysis of pooled pre-existing farming data from sources, including PCA scouting records, pesticide use reports, geospatial and weather records. Basically taking in all of the data that the industry is collecting as you like you're out in the field, you know, every, every you know, multiple times a week, you're you're in the field, like there's so many people in the field all the time, um, pooling this observational data so we can get a, an overview of what's happening, the covering broader spatial and temporal scales than the, what I can get to in a single like field experiment at the field station in a little research plot. So what um, the data set that we um, collected from 10 different growers um, looking at 200 different commercial citrus groves of oranges and mandarins for up to 10 years of data, it's a lot more data than, than I would have been able to, to access. And so we analyzed this um, to look at what was happening overall with pest densities and damage from the different pests in oranges and compared to mandarins. Um, and so the, the pest I'll use as an example, we did this for a number of different pests in the Central Valley. Um, the forktail bush Katie did is my favorite of them, um, just because it's um, sort of charismatic to work with. Um, but they, um, for the citrus industry there, they, um, have a low treatment threshold. Basically, if you see a Katie did, you you want to treat for it. Um, there's not really effective biological control options available, so it's a broad spectrum pesticide. Oh, it can have noise over there. It's that door. Um, so they feed. They're an early season pest. They feed on the young fruit after petal fall, um, and the chewing damage causes these. Um, holes in the rind that persist to harvest and cause these characteristic um, round scars in the rind. Um, this is all fresh market um, produce. No one buys fruit with these um, scars in it. So it's a loss of a loss of value if that goes to juice. Um, so what did we find for Katie did pest densities. So this is um, PCA scouting data pulled from lots of farms. And what we see in oranges, and I'm just showing today the, the true mandarins, so that this is tangos, aphoras, and the clementines. The densities of Katie dids are pretty much the same in oranges and mandarins. So after, when the fruit's small, if you go and count Katie dids in your field, pretty similar densities. And we could did all the statistics to remove other potential variation from other confounding variables like grove location and sampling year. 
What we see when we look at the scouting report, the um, bin sample data at harvest, almost no damage by katydids in mandarins. For especially for the um, the true mandarins, the the reticulata, it was negligible damage in the in the the scouting data the, of the sample bins. So you basically don't find damaged fruit in by with the katydid did scars in mandarins compared to what you'd expect from what you're seeing in oranges. Um, and we went to, we, this was such a dramatic difference. We went to the field ourselves and, and surveyed about um, 20,000 fruit. We saw the same thing. We couldn't, basically couldn't find any katydid did scarred fruit um, in the mandarins. So um, really dramatic difference here compared to what you'd expect given the similar densities of katydids in oranges. So we see from, uh, from this result, the katydids are present in mandarins, but fruit scarring is rare. In <clears throat> the tomatoes, it's basically non-existent. So this was um, really exciting, interesting result, but we're not done yet. Um, we needed to do some field experiments to work out what was driving this result. Like why, why is this happening? And we have to do this because the potential like hypotheses that we, we came up with when we were thinking about what might be going on, they have different management implications. So for example, it could be feeding aversion. Maybe the katydids are in the mandarin groves, but they're not feeding on the fruit. In which case, great, they're not a pest. Um, maybe the damage is healing. So the, the fruit, the mandarins are better at oranges at recovering from feeding damage. Maybe the mandarins are better at upsizing damaged fruit. So the citrus, when they do the initial like after petal fall, they, they drop like 90% of the, the fruit. Um, maybe mandarins can preferentially drop the damaged fruit and maybe they're better at that than oranges. Or maybe the scarring in mandarins looks different and we're just not recognizing it. And in that case, the the fruit might, um, you know, maybe we're getting it wrong. Maybe we're missing katydids and, you know, not controlling for them when we should be. And so we ran a bunch of um, field experiments over um, a few years uh, caging the katydids on the fruit. We did survival studies, preference tests in the lab, um, tagging the fruit, following like each individual fruit, following it through to harvest to see like, does it upsize from the tree? What happens? And what we found, so I'll run through each of the four hypotheses for sweet oranges. Um, so here the, this is um, no katydid and then um, a katydid at two different time points after petal fall. As we expect, the katydids chewed on the fruit. So the this here we're looking at different levels of damage. So the um the black part of the bar here, a lot of the fruit has these had these deep chewed holes. And um and then some like not as deep damage, but a lot of the fruit was fed on by the katydids. In the tango mandarins, the true mandarins, we saw almost no feeding damage. When we caged katydids on mandarin fruit, they'll take a little taste and then reject the feeding opportunity. They all we see are these little bite marks. They basically just didn't feed on the fruit. So strong support. For the first hypothesis, that'd be some chemical resistance. Um, built in the Sorry, was that a question about the mechanism? Um, we we uh, there was um, Hannah Carl at Davis was starting to follow up on that um, with a, a metabolomics study to see if there's some um, 
something in the rind, like the, I mean, the citrus ha has a lot of chemical defense properties. Um, I don't know where that research is or um, if, if that's being completed yet. That was a couple of years ago. She was was starting to find out like why um, the, the Katie dids aren't feeding on the mandarins. So we don't know yet, but um, stay tuned. Um, so when we look at the, um, the here as the, the fruit matures, the damage in mandarins was so light to begin with. By the time the fruit's harvested, we can't find the damage. Um, it, it's, it disappears. We couldn't find it to take measurements of, of these, these the, the negligible damage that there was to begin with. So for the tango, the true reticulata tango alfora mandarins, we found um, feeding aversion, the, the, they're resistant to scarring because the katydids reject opportunities to feed on the fruit. The fruit that does get the sort of light damage that they do um, incur, it, it disappears by harvest. So it sort of heals. Um, so I won't run through these next two because we, for the tangos, we didn't find support for those. But then um, let's look now at clementines. Um, so what do we see? Test. We did all of this again for the clementine mandarins. Remember, we saw the same pattern in the, the um, PCA scouting data and the, the bin samples. So what's going on in clementines? And here we found the opposite <laughs> the hypotheses. In clementines, we tested four different um, uh, varieties. Uh, hypothesis one, strong... Um, <laughs> strong feeding by the the katydids they devoured the young clementine fruit in some cases they um ate the like just chewed off the entire fruit um deep holes lots of of surface damage they fed heavily on the clementines um so really different here from what was going on in the the reticulata this um, damage, when we we, you know, we tagged each fruit, tracked this through to harvest, it didn't disappear. The um, damage was very visible at harvest on these fruit that had been fed on. And um, we found also, as we tracked the fruit, the damaged fruit was more likely to absize. So here you're looking at the, the fruit with the deep holes, um, as as we tracked its um, the fruit that was retained on the tree, more of it fell off. Um, and interestingly, it was late in the season. So at um, the first part, like at the first time point, um, you know, it's, a few of them had fallen off. But then the real drop was later, as we as the fruit was mature. And what we noticed when we were taking these measurements, a lot of the fruit had split along the scar. So where this, this scar line is, the, the clementines had split. And so this isn't what we were expecting when we um, made this hypothesis. We thought it was maybe like an adaptive prefer preferential abscission early, that the, the clementines were um, preferentially keeping undamaged fruit. Instead, we saw this late um, shedding of scarred fruit and this is after the um, the fruits are already been invested in by the plant, so we we don't know, but um, it this could potentially like reduce the yield. It's it's like less of an adaptive strategy here. And then um, this scarring you might notice looks really different from the round scars that we see in oranges. This is like jagged web scarring. This looks like cutworm or caterpillar damage. And when we went back to the database, um, the caterpillar scarring in the, um, the bin samples is overrepresented in clementines compared to what you'd expect given the, the lower densities of caterpillars um, compared to oranges. And so here there's potentially some scar misclassification because this was a previously unrecognized damage type. You, you don't know what's going on in here unless you sort of, you know, we tracked each fruit that we knew was fed on by a katydid. So here for clementines, this is the second question. 
the forktail bush katydid feeding on clementines causes rind scars that look like these jagged lines similar to cutworm damage. Um, so this uh, here it was support for hypothesis three and four in the clementines. So really different um, stories in these, these two mandarin types and different from what we see in oranges. And what I really um, enjoyed from this um, was the feedback between the, the eco-informatics part, the, the PCA and grower data um, that sort of gave us a good starting point. The katydids are present, but fruit scarring's rare. And then the field experiments um, told us like why and what's going on. And so it was the, the feedback was really helped between these two methods really helped to drive the research forward um, efficiently. Um, so if you want to read more about this, I'd recommend the Citrograph articles as a starting point. I'll have all of the research papers and these, these publications up on the website in the next few weeks once I get that live. Um, we also um, updated, there was um, a guide to citrus fruit scarring, like a photographic guide from UCANR. We've now made an updated version um, like that complements that looking at mandarins because the, the presentation of the scarring is so different compared to oranges. Um, and then we updated all of the I IPM guidelines, um, not just for katydids, for earwigs and thrips. Um, so that's that's all um, on the UC IPM and UC a &R, um, websites. Um, so that's sort of my some of, like an example of the work that I was doing um, at, at Davis and at Lynn Cove. And I'm planning to carry this forward um, in with, um, so Southern California and continue some of the work that um, Beth and Monique were doing, um, particularly with ACP management, um, continue some of the projects uh, with Citrus Thrips. So I'm working with Sandipa in the Central Valley um, and Hamatal Cohen in um, Ventura and um, in San Diego as well. So we have some a uh, few pesticide trials starting, um, the big um, survey and trying to get um, expand the database that we have for um, from the Central Valley, bring in um, Southern California data. Um, to look at and, and pair that with experiments, especially for thrips and ACP that are big issues at the moment. I also have some continuing work from this, um, an interesting thing we saw in the, the database that um, work from the Central Valley that I haven't had a, didn't get a chance to, to look at yet. Um, in the database, the um, cottony cushion scale densities are much higher in mandarins compared to oranges. There's like outbreaks of cottony cushion scale. Um, and this is your third question. Um, so the cottony cushion scale has historically been really well controlled um, in, in oranges by um, the parasitoid fly and the Vidalia beetle, which is especially active in the Central Valley. Um, so we don't know if there's some breakdown of um, the control, like what's going on with this Vidalia beetle in mandarins that's that's um, sort of causing the cottony cushion scale densities to be higher. So um, that's another little project we're following up with. Um, and then lastly, uh, I'm not sure, I, I guess I'm over time, I just have a few minutes. Um, I've, I've been meeting with uh, Tom Paring, um, to talk about dates and start some date research. So um, uh, sort of hearing uh, at the moment we're at the stage of sort of hearing what the research needs are and um, one uh, pest in particular is the, um, the Banks grass mite. Um, the, the, these are uh, Tom's slides. I'm not sure if he's online or has... Um, I think he can't. Yeah. So um, I've been meeting with Tom to take over and continue some of the the work that he's been doing in dates and sort of get connected with the date industry. Um, so the, the first project we'll look at is with this um, date mite that um, causes webbing on the, the bunches of developing dates and um, that results in this stippling on the, the fruit. Um, and Tom 
this group has done um, some work already with the six spotted thrips and the predatory mites um, and looking at sort of the effectiveness of these and, um, you know, when can we release them? When it like, what's, how do they interact with insecticides and doing some insecticide trials? Um, so, and there's, you know, a really good foundation of, of work here. So I've been looking at um, what, what are sort of the next steps to continue this research. Um, so uh, preparing a um, proposal for the the date commission, um, starting with the the date might natural enemies, um, and you know planning into the future what's the research we're going to be doing there. So I'm really keen to hear from everybody. Um, thank you to all of the funding sources, the pest control advisors, and growers who participated in this project in the Central Valley. Um, Jay, Beth, and Tom. Um, and I'm really looking forward to hearing from you and I'll hope to see you all in person soon. Thanks, Bo. Appreciate Thank it. Uh, so we're going to talk a little bit today about a little bit so you understand bees more and how they pollinate so that you can keep them safe when you are applying any pesticides to citrus or any other crop really. If you are having pollinators come in to do their pollination and get a larger crop or a better crop, then you need to be able to protect them while they're on your crop doing their work. So we're going to talk about that today and give you some good ideas on how to accomplish that the best. So first question, most citrus fruit is self-fertile, so it doesn't have any benefit from pollinators being brought in. It's mixed. <laughs> false. Okay. I say it's true. It's fine. Okay, I got a true, I got a false, so I got most aren't self-fertile. I mean these yeah. matters there. Some of it's true and other ones are false, yeah. depending upon the variety. Yeah. 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 So that is both. So you need both. <laughs> I just say it's false because there is some benefit for bringing pollinators in, but sometimes they do create more seeds in seedless versions. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> but generally bringing in pollinators is going to increase the amount of fruit you have, increase the quality of that fruit, and even the weight of that fruit. So they're bigger, juicier, more evenly developed. They really have a lot of benefits. And besides the benefit to your crop, it's also going to benefit the bees because they have a good source of pollen, which helps the bees to grow. And then of course, they make wonderful honey off of that. Now, is all honey the same taste? No. Have you tried several honeys? I have. Yay, you're going to get to try some. <laughs> so that's the fun part that we'll talk about more at the end. But there's lots of honeys that can be produced here in Arizona. And I'm really working with the beekeepers to try to produce more of those honeys by moving their bees around to the other crops. So a little bit about bees. There's over 20,000 species of bees and only seven of them produce honey. And one of them is a small stingless bee in South America and it produces a tiny little amount of honey. So there's even less that actually produce honey for us. And out of those 5,000, uh, the, there's 5,000 species of native bees. The, in the US, Arizona has about 1,300, California has 1,600, and our Sonoran Desert has six to 700 native bees. But a lot of those don't pollinate our crops because they go very small distances from where they have their burrow or their home. And some of them are specialists. They only pollinate certain plants. So none of those necessarily, not many of those can do you any good if you have a crop, unless you happen to have their habitat all the way around your crop. And most native bees are solitary. So it's one, she provisions a nest, and then um, you know, she has a short lifespan and she'll produce some babies and then they come out the following year. Mason bees happen to be really good at pollination, especially early on your stone fruits, but they travel a very short distance. So you need to have them all throughout the crop to get good pollination with them. Uh, so yeah, native species usually do very localized pollination. So 
So <clears throat> there's three cats in the honeybee colony. Of course, we know about the queen and she doesn't leave the hive much. She just lays eggs. They feed her royal jelly, she lays eggs. She lays about her body weight in eggs every single day. So that's around 2000 eggs every day. And she mates that one time when she's a virgin queen, just hacked out, um, she goes out and she'll, she has to mate between 12 and 20 times. Well, it's all during the same time, but with 12 to 20 drones. And she stores that sperm in a spermatheca a special device she has in her, and she can selectively fertilize or not fertilize her eggs as she lays them. So the fertilized eggs are all the worker bees. They're the mass of the workers. Of course, they, they make the wax, they feed the queen, they produce the royal jelly, they, um, they take care of the baby bees, they clean, they defend, they forage. All the work done generally is by all the worker bees. And in a small hive, when it gets really cold out, they tend to shrink a little bit. So you might only have 10,000 in a really cold winter, but in the height of the season, they can be upwards of 50,000 to 80,000 bees in a hive. So there's lots of them. Uh, the drone, of course, are the males. They don't have a stinger, so and they're great big. You can tell them just by looking that they're a drone because they're so much larger than the queen or the worker bees. But all they do, they live for one thing, and that's to mate a virgin queen. That's all they do. So of course, when resources get low, when there's not enough food out there, or it starts to get cold, they kick the drones out of the hive first thing. Because all they do is they consume, but they don't help collect. So they're gone. Uh, it takes about 30,000 bees to pollinate an acre of fruit trees. So if you are bringing pollinators in, you want to make sure that there's at least six to eight strong frames of bees per hive to be able to really do the pollination that you're hoping for. And they do the best pollination within about 400 feet of the hive. So spacing them out through or around the crop is the best idea to get the best pollination. So during the active time, when bees are flying a lot and foraging a lot, they only live six weeks. And the ones that you're seeing out doing that foraging work, they're in their last two weeks of their life. So most of the work is inside the hive during those first four weeks. And then the last two weeks of their life, they literally work themselves to death. They're out foraging. They'll make 2000 trips to the flowers, um, of course, they have to fly further if there aren't any resources close. And so that wears their wings out even faster. So having the bees close to the floral resources is the best way to get lots of pollination done. And as bees fly, they get positively charged. So, and then the pollen is negatively charged. So when they land on a flower, that pollen clings to all the little hairs on their body. And then when they're covered with pollen, they groom themselves and they mix it with a little bit of nectar and they pack it on their little back legs as pollen pellets. And you know, then they'll take that home. They turn that into bee bread. They let it ferment a little bit and it's more nutritious once it's fermented than it is just as pollen. But that's what they use for their nutrition. So all of their lipids and their minerals, all of their nutrients that they need really are in the pollen. So it's really a good idea to have them have access to a number of different floral resources than just one type. They have that balanced nutrition then rather than just singular nutrition. Um, another interesting fact about honeybees is that they only collect the amount of pollen that they need. And that's usually the first thing they do in the morning. They go out and collect the pollen till maybe 9, 9.30, possibly 10 o'clock. Usually it shuts down by about 9.30. And then they spend the rest of the day collecting nectar. So they go and get that pollen. They bring in what they need. And then almost the whole entire workforce that's foraging is out looking for nectar. And they will work a source until it's depleted. That's why pollination works. We bring bees on, they can see the tree in 3D, so they can see how many flowers there are. 
and they will go towards the very best resource out there until it's depleted. And, the, and trees keep making nectar until their flowers are pollinated. So they work together to be able to get really good pollination because it doesn't take just one bee visiting a flower once to deposit enough pollen on that stigma to get good pollination. You need, on a cucumber, you need about 30 visits from bees. On melons, you need a thousand pollen grains deposited on that stigma to get a nice, even developed, sweet melon. A thousand pollen grains. Now, granted, pollen grain is small, and when they're all over their body, they can deposit more than one when they hit that stigma, but it takes several visits from bees to get enough pollen on there to complete the pollination process. So instead of having all your bees at the end of a row or at the end of the field, all in one place, it's much better to space them around. And remember, they do about 400 feet is where they do their best pollination. Further than that, they're still pollinating, especially if they run out of resources closer, but it's better within that 400 feet. So spacing them around, doing a little bit of work to figure out how to space them around to get the best pollination is well worth the time and effort. <clears throat> so for maximum pollination, the bee colony should be at least what size? 10,000 bees, two deep boxes, 30,000 bees, or one deep box? Which one? Oh, somebody was listening. Yay, 30,000 bees. Okay, <laughs> now 10,000 bees, not that they couldn't do any pollination, but you're certainly not gonna get the work out of them that you will out of 30,000 bees. And even with that 30,000 bees, when you're looking at that six to eight frames to make sure you have enough bees, you want capped brood on there too. That means they're gonna be emerging soon and replacing those older bees so that you're gonna have a nice big workforce. Okay, one deep box, that's 10 frames. Two deep boxes would be 20 frames. You don't need all two deep boxes to get good pollination. Even one box is good. Usually they'll have another super on top of that to collect the honey, but you would at least one box. And then uh, usually they're gonna have another box for the honey on top, at least on citrus they will. On other things where they're not collecting a whole lot of nectar, they might not have the honey super. On. Okay, so bees have those, they have a million tiny hairs all over their bodies, on their eyes, everything. And those are, you know, they really stick to the pollen. So then this one doesn't show up, but the next one does. You can see where the pollen pellet is. They groom themselves, mix it up so it's sticky, stick it on there. And the legs even, it's concave. So right here on this part of the leg, it's concave. And then it has some hairs coming out around it. So it really hangs on to that pollen pellet well. Young bees, of course, when they first start foraging, they're not going to be able to pack on the size of pellets that the older bees will. So you can tell if they're young ones or if they're older. If they have a great big pollen pellet on them, then they are an older forager. So they have two great big compound eyes on either side of their head, taking so much information. They have over 6,000 little facets that all work together to give them lots of information. And then they have three single eyes in between, right about where the antenna are. Their antenna give them so much information about the world around them. They, I hate to say that they smell with them, but they do sense smells with their antenna. So if their antenna are damaged, then they generally aren't going to live very long because they can't find their way back to the hive. They just don't do very well if they don't have good antenna. Um, they see ultraviolet light and they don't see the color red. Now, almost all bees, but especially Africanized bees, which we have problems with here, they see dark colors, so especially black, as a predator or as a threat. So that's part of why we wear a lot of white when we work with bees, but it's also so that we can see the bees on us and we don't 
take them inside without knowing. But one of the things that the veil on most of our beekeeping suits, what color is it? Black. Yeah. So the Africanized bees, they are just coming for that veil. They're coming for your face, <laughs> trying to sting you. And I've asked so many beekeeping supply places, can we get veils that are white? And nobody produces them because so few people have to deal with the Africanized bee. So it's just the southern part of the states that have to deal with them. Um, but they can see different, since they see ultraviolet, there are ultraviolet markings on flowers that guide them right down into that nectar. It's really kind of a good partnership that they have. Okay, so drones have a lot of plate organs in their antenna and their antenna are one segment longer, but it tells them so much information. And like I said, they do kind of smell with them. And bees do a lot of their communication through smells. So that's what the queen is doing. She's putting out pheromones to let them know that all is well in the hive. Um, they can smell alarm pheromones. So if you open up a beehive and you see all those bees tip their little tails up into the air and start fanning, they're sending out alarm pheromone. If you get enough of them doing it at the same time, you can smell the alarm pheromone. Guess what it smells like? Banana Laffy Taffy. Okay, really sweet banana, super sweet. And so it, if you've smelled that, you should have done some smoking. That's why we use smoke. And the smoke is not some magical thing that they all start you know, devouring honey or anything. All that does is mask the pheromone smell. So if they shoot out that alarm pheromone, they can't smell it because all they can smell is the smoke. So that's why we smoke the entry before we go in. We crack the lid and smoke them, let that get down into the hive so they're all calm and we can go about our work. Now with European bees, that works. With Africanized bees, they don't care. They're mad that you even looked at their hive. They don't want you around. They're gonna tell you so and bring about 12 of their buddies. And even if you leave, they're gonna follow you. European bees, if you walk a few feet away, they're gonna go and say, yeah, you better learn your lesson and they'll go back to their work. But Africanized bees are gonna follow you. You can walk and walk and walk and they're just gonna still be trying to sting you. So that's part of why they are much more aggressive. So we have to control for that. And how we do that in Arizona, the, probably the best way is just to requeen. We always mark our queens. They have a color dot on their thorax. So you can see right here, there's a good little spot. And on a queen, we'll just mark her with a little bit of paint. So we can spot her really easy. And we do regular inspections in our hives not only to make sure that she's laying really well, there's lots of eggs and brood and everybody's happy, but we look for the queen to make sure she's in there. If you crack the lid and they they fly out and start getting in your face, you better find that queen because they've become Africanized. And you take that queen out, you get a bred European queen. We don't open breed our queens here in Arizona. You can't because she'll turn out Africanized. So you get one that's been artificially inseminated. She's in a cage. You'll squish the old queen on that cage so that their smells will blend. And then you'll hang her in there in the hive. And hopefully within a couple of days, they've accepted her. And you can tell because they won't be biting and chewing at the screen and trying to kill her. And then you can let her out and she'll start laying eggs. And after those Africanized bees have died off and her eggs have started to hatch out, then they'll calm right back down because it's her genetics, the queen's genetics that control that. So yes, we have to requeen a lot here in Arizona and that's how we control the Africanized bees. So yes, you can capture a swarm and you can requeen it, but it, you gotta take them out somewhere away from people where they can't be attacking anybody and you requeen out there and then wait about nine weeks and they'll turn around. Most of those queens come home. I heard from Hawaii. Yeah. Early season, we do get a bunch of queens in from Hawaii, but we can also get them from Florida because they have controlled the Africanized strains down there. Um, their state association really controls 
Africanized bees. So, um, and we can get them from other places. There happens to be a guy here. And matter of fact, there's uh, Dr. Kahit Ozturk at ASU. He actually teaches how to do artificial insemination. But can you imagine on a bee? Yeah. Yeah, it's I've, tiny. I've heard that Africanized bees work harder. Like they're better for the, the field for pollination. Well, right? they, they do some things much better. They're much... The drones are more present. There's a lot more drones in that drone congregation area. So they tend to breed more often. They don't set aside as much honey though. So sometimes they will build these big old homes <coughs> and they have some good sized numbers, but they don't save as much honey or stores. What, what was the interest in those bees before they really kind of got away from the... <laughs> well, because they took them, they were in South America in tropical climates. But what was the interest in bringing them uh, if they to, didn't produce as much honey? To do better in a tropical climate. Oh, okay. Because the European bees weren't doing well in that tropical climate. I was wondering, all right. So yeah, they were trying to get a bee that was better than what they had. And see, they also have that South American bee that's a stingless bee, but it produces so little honey. And, you know, it just isn't very good if you want honey production. So they were trying to bring one over from the same latitude that would do better and it just didn't work out, they got out. Okay, so now you can also use mason bees, leaf cutter bees, they're also good pollinators. The mason bees will only go about 100 feet from their nest and you can put those boxes up. So you can, mason bees are actually really easy way to get some good pollination, but you have to put the boxes around in a lot of places because they won't fly very far. And again, they have a very short lifespan too, but they're cocoons you can just keep in cold storage, like keep them in your fridge until your flowers start appearing. Then you take them out and they start hatching out. And they usually will return to where they're hatching out to lay their young. So you can be pretty successful with mason bees if you want to use them instead. But they do need some wet mud around so they can build their little dividers. And the straws that you use have to be 5 16 That's the size they prefer for a cavity. And they should be about six inches long because about every inch they're laying another egg and a lump of pollen. And those will all be females. The last one on the outside of that uh, tube is going to be a male. So they come out first and then all the remainders are females. We want more females because they're the ones doing the pollination and laying the eggs for next year. Okay, we don't need to go into too much about mason bees, but they are really good pollinators and they're kind of messy. They just shove their pollen everywhere. Okay, so honeybees tend to gather pollen early in the morning and then switch over to nectar late, later in the morning and throughout the day. Um, they will work a source until it's depleted. And as they're hovering over a flower, not only can they sense if another bee has been there and depleted that flower, but they can tell if it's been restored with nectar. And if it hasn't, they'll just go over another flower until they find where there's some nectar and then they'll go and feed. And trees, of course, can keep producing more nectar to get the pollination <laughs> completed. Um, and yeah, they'll gather as much nectar as they can get their hands on. So if you're gonna have a pollination contract, you need a lot of information in there, mainly how to protect the grower, how to protect the beekeeper. Probably the most important thing is Knowing when your crop is going into bloom and that, and then how long it's going to be in bloom so you can have the bees on your property during that time, and then they take the bees away. And you don't want to be spraying anything during that period. Now, there are some things, if you apply a pesticide right before the bees came in and it's on the leaves or on the petals or it's systemic, especially if it's systemic, it can actually be in the nectar and pollen. So as they're feeding and then they're taking that back to their colony, they can be taking damaging pesticides back to the colony, which is not good. You won't see the damage until you go back to the colony and then 
you can be killing the, the larva, you can be killing all the bees inside there that are feeding. So it's really important to look for the bee box on the pesticide labels and manage your pesticides. Okay, and you have to have phone numbers. You should be able to give, as a grower, you should be able to give 48 hours notice to that pollinator so that, and we have to pick up bees at night, right? We have to wait till they all come home, then you close up the hive and you haul them off in the dead of night. So if you call me at 3 p.m. in the afternoon, I might not be able to get out that night, but I will make it my highest priority to get out the next night and get those bees off of there so you can go ahead and spray your crop as necessary. But you need to have that kind of agreement with your beekeeper so they know what you expect from them and to, you know, to spread out your bees, how much they're going to charge. If they're making a whole bunch of honey on your crop, they probably don't have to charge you as much. But if they have to feed their bees the whole time they're on your crop, they're going to have to charge more. If they have to travel a long distance, they're going to have to charge more. If they're close by, not so much. Okay, so these are some of the commonly used pesticides for citrus. And we'll go through, I want you to know what a bee box looks like. That's what you're looking for. And it'll tell you specifically how that pesticide affects bees and give you some you know, directions on how to avoid bee kills. So this is XRL. Now this one is great because it has um, directions for use if you're under a pollination contract or if you're on ornamentals, because there's different ways to manage that. So if you're a pollination contract, you wanna make sure you notify your pollinator 48 hours prior and he should remove them or somehow protect them. I would remove. If I was you know, being told that a pesticide is gonna be sprayed that can kill my bees, I'm gonna get my bees off of there just to protect them. And um, otherwise, if it's just on ornamentals where you don't have bees actively there on a pollination contract, but they might be visiting, then you wanna make sure that you're applying after sunset. Why? Because the bees are in their home. And then if you give the pesticide enough time to dry, then it might not harm the bees. Uh, or if you're applying it when temperatures are below 55, bees can't fly when it's below 55. Wasn't that a Sammy Hagar song said? Yeah. Can't be at 55. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But there are some emergencies where they're going to allow you to spray regardless, apply that pesticide if there are some emergencies. Of course, we don't want any bee kills. Um, and usually the guidance is don't apply while your crops are in bloom. And even if there's uh, like habitat or blooming flowers around your crop, you gotta be really careful not to get drift on them. If you can't keep from getting some drift on them, if you're worried about that, maybe you wanna mow off the flowers before you apply to protect the bees. Okay, so here's a couple of them. And I pulled this stuff right off the labels. So delegate, was active ingredient is highly toxic to bees, remove bees before applying. Pretty easy, right? PQZ, do not apply this product while bees are foraging. So during the day, I would even say, you know, I would read a little bit more, but it says now, do not apply this product until flowering is complete and all petals have fallen. Okay, so that one's gonna kill bees too. So they want, and, once the petals have fallen, you're moving your bees off anyway. So that's good. That means pollen is done. Okay, Agrimet, highly toxic. If they're exposed to direct treatment, um, do not apply this product or allow it to drift onto blooming crops if bees are in the area. Again, Bexar, highly toxic for direct treatment. Again, the same thing, do not apply while you have blooming going on. 
And trust, highly toxic. Mustang Max, highly toxic. And it, they're not worried just about honeybees, it's pollinators. So you gotta try, you know, try other IPM ways, try some planning, whatever, so that you don't have to apply during the bloom. Usually the bloom's not that long. If you can get by without it, that's better. Lavento, potentially toxic to honeybee larva. And it's just through the residues in the pollen or nectar, but not to the adult bees. But that can be bad. You definitely want to let your pollinator know this one, because even though it might not kill the adult flying force, it could kill all the larva back in his hive. He needs to know that and then make that determination. I would move my bees off. Because if you kill all the larva, that's 21 days of work for that queen bee. And so, it's your your population's gonna do a deep dive before that queen can catch up and get some more bees growing. Okay, belief is moderately toxic to bees. And so you wanna protect pollinating insects by following the directions for drift. Okay, and then we have a couple low risk rating on Centaur. It's an insect growth regulator. So they usually make these, they target that insect. So insects are not all the same. So it's not gonna affect bees apparently on this very low risk rating. Checkmate is a mating disruption. So it's listed for Omri for um, organic production and they're pheromones and pheromones are different. So if bees can smell if you belong to their colony or not, they can certainly tell the difference between pheromones and that's not going to affect. Okay, so getting the best pollination benefits. Remember, you want to have six to eight strong frames. Also, are there nearby competing blooming plants? So that's the problem with melons right now is that, remember, bees see in 3D. So if they see a citrus tree and it's just covered there's a million blooms on that tree. That's pretty tempting. If they see a melon field and there's a bloom here, then there's another bloom there, then they have to fly over here, that's a lot more work, right? All that flight in between, trying to find flowers that haven't been harvested already. So you need to put two to three hives per acre on melons to get the same pollination benefits because they're not as desirable. And if you have anything else blooming around them, you're going to have a really hard time getting a good crop out of the. And that's if all of your irrigation is optimal and your soil health is optimal. So fertility, irrigation, even if you have those perfect pollinators can make a difference in those two things, but they can't overcome those two things. So if you cut out water at the wrong time on your citrus, it's still going to drop into the little babies that are developing. Okay, so what is, you want at least one acre, one honeybee hive, strong hive per acre, but also within that 400 feet is where you're going to get your best pollination. And then, of course, you have to have weather conditions that are 55 or higher. So the bees weren't very mobile this morning. It was cold. They're hunkering down. They're waiting until it gets warm. So that's why it's important to have that early morning sun get in that front porch of the beehive. It gets them warm, they start getting activated, but they're not gonna go out. They might go out real quick and say, ooh, it's cold out there, because they can't shiver their flight muscles well enough if it's 50, less than 55. Okay, so you need optimum pollinator presence, optimum soil fertility, and optimum uh, irrigation and weather to get the best crop. And of course, we can always choose less toxic pesticides. We've come a long way in the last 20 or so years. Um, you know, years ago, they, they put bees on cotton before and then they quit because there was really toxic chemicals they were using on them. And now they have much better ones so they can do it again. So use a less toxic pesticides and then use IPM. Of course, you're trying to protect the 
natural habitat as well as people, as well as the crop, as well as insects. So use your IPM strategies to try other things before you try chemicals. Um, definitely spray when bees are not foraging. You want to reduce drift onto non-target areas. Um, avoid dust and wettable powers during bloom because those are the most toxic to bees. They tend to carry those back to the hive. And uh, you can definitely have more pollinators by having field perimeters that are blooming. <coughs> and if you want, if you know that you're gonna get drift into those blooming perimeters, then mow off that flower before you, or you can till it under, depending on what kind of um, crop you have there. But also have some enhanced bee habitat somewhere on your farm, and that's going to get you more bees all the time. Okay, so this isn't question two, this is actually question three, but to avoid killing pollinators by insecticides, when should they be applied? Only systemically, after bloom, before or after the bee colonies are on the crop, or both B and C? I have a vote here for both. Anybody else? No? Okay. That would be the right. You want it after bloom or before or after the bees show up. That's the best answer. Okay, so we have some fun. I got on. Now, there's a lot of bees in, there are a number of beekeepers in Arizona that just leave their bees in one space. But the problem with that is we'll have some blooming plants and then we have nothing. Then we might have some blooming plants. It's all dependent on rain. It's not like they can just fly anywhere and get food all the time. So I'm really trying to educate the beekeepers to move their bees around to different crops. And along with that, harvest the honey off those different crops. So I brought in a nice selection of several honeys that can be grown here or harvested here in Arizona. If you start on the light side and then move your way over, I want you to test, grab a few spoons, grab four spoons, three or four, and start with the light, try one of those, see if you like that, then get a medium and then try a dark if you dare. Some people really like the dark honeys. Yeah, I do. Glenn likes the dark honeys. Um, I like some of them, others not so much. And then I brought one, that is a really powerful honey and it's not from the United States. It's actually from Europe where they have chestnut trees. And I'll just say, be careful if you try that one because it tastes okay at first and then it kind of has an aftertaste that hits you in the back of your throat that's not pleasant. So you might want to have something after that. Um, take a drink of water in between. All you're going to do, I have these little taster spoons dip it into the honey or some of them have a little pour spout so you can just pour a drop on your spoon you're going to put it on your tongue spread it around so you can get a good taste of it and then look on here to try to get the vocabulary on how that tastes to you if your nose is clogged you're not going to be able to taste very well because they're tied together but once you figure out the honey flavor family that you like then you'll always be able to choose the honeys that you like because you can pick them in that flavor family. Okay, so I like the floral. I like the, uh, the fruity one. That's just what I enjoy. But, you know, some of those darker honeys are really good. Some people really like those. They would be good for certain things like barbecue sauces and all that. And then that chestnut, even though it's really horrible by itself, if you... If you put it on a strong cheese, like a gorgonzola or a blue, together they're kind of magical. So you can combine honeys with other things. And I have publications on that, so if you're interested in that, if you like doing charcuterie boards, I have all sorts of information. You can get that on the cooperative extension webpage under publications, just type in honey, and all the honey beans and honey stuff will come up. But work with a partner on this to kind of describe and see which flavors you like. On the back is just showing you all the different colors of honey. It can go from water white 
down to color of molasses pizza. Some of them kind of taste like molasses, but the darker ones tend to have more minerals in there. That's why they have that stronger flavor. But you know, in New Zealand, they say that's what makes their manuka honey so healing. All the minerals. So anyway, start at the light side, move to the dark. No double dipping with the spoons, throw them away. Okay, there's a trash can right there. I have plenty of spoons for all of you. So yeah, just taste a few of them. You probably won't be able to taste all of them because that's just too much. It'll overpower your palate. But try a few out and uh, let me know which ones you like. And then it looks like lunch is here. So I got a question. I'll be keeper collect the pollen. Got a little thing in the bottom of the entryway and it knocks the pollen off the legs of the bees. Yeah. And so he collects the pollen. So the bees have to go back and work harder to get more yeah. pollen. Yeah, so when I collect pollen, that's great. If you're taking all that pollen off of them, then they don't have enough to feed the hive, the colony, and their baby. So then they have to go right back out and keep harvesting pollen. So it's a really simple device. Basically, they're crawling through a hole or a screen of some sort, and it knocks the big pollen pants off of them. So then they have to get smarter and only harvest little bits and probably wiggle through to get enough pollen in to feed their the babies. So when I harvest pollen, because I do like to harvest just to see what's blooming and what they're bringing in, because um, pollen's all different colors too. Yeah. But I just harvest one day. So I'll do it on the first of every month or something and I'll harvest from that day and then that's it. But I'm, I'm growing it for a different reason. If that's what they're doing for their business, then they have to make sure that they just don't starve their sea colony. So they didn't know what they were doing. Yeah. But it's the volume super, yes. the so you have to allow them some in because that's what they're feeding their babies on. I have a question. Yes. You know, when you have a, a bunch of hives and the, and the fellow takes the hives away, and but the next day there's still plenty of bees that spent the night out and it down. So the next morning, you know, we'll leave a hive there. There's thousands of bees and they're really pissed off to coming they're, back and- uh, They're confused. Yeah, they can't figure out what's going on. Would those bees congregate in a single hive? And if you put a queen in there, would they survive or would they kill each other off? No, they probably would. They'd be probably be happy for it. But to ensure, so if I move my bees off, yeah, I don't know why they would do it, why they wouldn't be home if they were gone. You're so if you get like 14 to 20 hives or so, each hive is segregated from each other, right? Mm -hmm. Even those, so once they're all gone, now you have a mixture of all those 20 hives flying yeah. around. You know, so. Well, they tend to like each other okay if things are desperate, okay? And also, if bees are coming in and they're bringing in nectar or pollen, they're going to let them in. They're like, yeah, come on in. But if they're coming in and they want to take... Yeah, well, most of them would be the ones hide. working out there because... They're all the other ones. The only reason they're out all night is because they're out for the ground. Yeah, but they shouldn't be out at night. Usually, honeybees come home. So if they got caught out for some reason, yeah. or maybe There's they didn't have the energy. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, they didn't have the energy to get home, or got cold, or I mean, there's a few reasons. But I would leave a hive there so they have somewhere to come, and I would probably have a, a frame in there, at least a frame, so that they can have food, they have some pollen, mm -hmm. and they, and then the but beekeeper should, can come back. Could you leave a queen in there, uh, like a new queen or not, or would they? I wouldn't necessarily do that, but I would leave at least a box, because yeah. they'll come in, and they can survive a few days without. So if they come in, then I would come back and grab that box and go shake them into another box back at my apiary. Because I kind of treat them in between. So you'll take the honey off in between crops, and you're going to mark what crop it came off of. You're going to put a clean, empty honey super on to send them to the next crop. But I would also feed them. I might check them for mites and make sure that they don't have uh, too high a level of mites. If I need to treat them for mites, I'm going to treat them then when they're not on a crop and there's no honey on them. And then they'll be ready for the next crop. Uh, in this time, uh, I wanted to share uh, with you um, about the Daypan Research at the Sonora State University in Campus San Luis Rio, Colorado, and the status of the Daypan industry in Mexico.
Uh, we are a multidisciplinary uh, research group at the university uh, where we carry out various uh, activities with day pan farmers, uh, where we carry out experiments uh, to obtain information for the publication of paper. Uh, in this image, we can see two papers uh, in works related to day palm polyps and seeds of day palm. Uh, in other papers, uh, we have talked about the use of the various uh, source of pollen and the characterization of the nutritional components of medule dates. We have also participated in various uh, book chapters with various publishers like this, for example. Uh, we commonly will make a uh, feel busy to learn uh, about good cultivation practice with farmers. Also, uh, we know to the status of the production and possible problems that farmers may have in Salerio, Colorado and Mexicali Valleys. We organize constant uh, training courts on the same, for example, in on December 6, uh, we finished the diploma in the integral cultivation of the pan in Mexicali Valley with farmers and the general public interested. Uh, last November, we had the second International Day Palm Festival in Mexico in collaboration with the Jalifa International Award for Day Palm and Agricultural Innovation from the, Un from the United Arab Emirates, uh, the Agri Agriculture Department of Mexico, and the Sonora State University. Uh, in this festival, we had a visit uh, Day Palm Research from Morocco. Egypt, Jordan, United Arab Emirates, Tunisia, USA, Spain, among others. In 2022, Alpha International Award decides to come to Mexico for the first time to the to organize uh, the fear the fear festival in Mexico with the sponsor chief of the government of the United Arab Emirates. Thanks to the collaboration with Khalifa International Award, we have been invited to participate in the festivals in Mauritania, Morocco, Egypt, and Jordan. Uh, participating in this scientific, in their scientific uh, symposium with various lectures about the culture of medieval date in Mexico. Locally, we have organized several online um, events related to the production of medieval dates in Mexico with the participation of renowned uh, research and companies. In the image, we can see two uh, two convocatories, uh, the FIRST International Medieval Day Colloquium and the FIRST International Forum of Day Palm. About the day production in Mexico, uh, the day producing area in Mexico is located in the state of Baja California, Sonora, Baja California Sur, and Coahuila. Uh, the day palm arrived in Mexico through the Spanish conquest in the 15th century, but the cultivation of medieval dates arrived in the early 60s and his production began in 1965, 67, in the San Luis Colorado Valley in the Las Cachoras Ranch. Uh, currently, we have around 2,300 hectares of day palm in production, but another 800 hectares are pending to enter to production. Uh, around 94% 94% of day production in Mexico is medieval variety. Around five, 
5% is date uh, Deglet North, and another 1% is other uh, varieties. For example, uh, Halawi, Karawi, uh, Creole dates, and others. This table, uh, we, can, we can see the world day production in 2021 uh, with almost 10 million tons of dates. As you know, Mexico is a country that produces small quantities of dates compared to large, to large uh, producers, uh, for example, Egypt, uh, Saudi Arabia, and Iran. In 2021, almost 20,000 tons of dates were produced in Mexico. That quantity represents a global contribution of 0.20%. However, in 2020, Mexican farmers produce almost 15,000 tons of medjool dates, turning Mexico into the third largest producer of medjool dates after Israel and the USA. In this table, we can see the main medjool date producer in the world. Israel and Saudi Arabia is way down. Israel is the, is the best producer in the world. The, no, Israel is the first uh, mm -hmm. producer of medjool dates in, in the world. Mexico uh, is an official register of producer of dates. Uh, we have 206 date palm farmers in the state of Sonora and Baja California. These companies are classified as micro, small, medium, and large according to the number of the hectares they, they own. In the table, we can see that the uh, major, ma majority are micro producers uh, with less than five hectares each, representing about 57% of the farmers. And only 30% are large farmers with more than 20 hectares each. There are around 15 uh, packing houses with high packing capacity. One of them packs around 10 million pounds and export them and export them mainly to the USA. Likewise, uh, around another 10 with medium capacity. And about the small companies normally use artisanal process for the packing. Medium and large um, companies have modern equipment for the cultivation and have various international certifications. 50% of day production in Mexico are export to USA, Australia, Canada, New Zealand, Thailand, Singapore, Indonesia, European countries, and some South American countries uh, like Argentina and Brazil. Mexico competes for the medjool day market with USA. Our main opportunity is that the production and labor costs are cheaper in Mexico than in the USA. Even some USA farmers send their days to Mexico and then return back to the USA. No. Now, so we, we have a comparative six, table dates. Uh, the production of medjool dates in Mexico and the USA. They have steel balls. In Mexico, the production of medjool dates is 94%, while in USA, <clears throat> 55%. And their this criterion, this correspond to 18,000 tons and 29,000 tons, respectively, of medjool uh, dates in both countries. The price of a kilogram medjool date in Mexico is around $6, while in the USA is $14. The per capita consumption of dates in Mexico is around 80 grams per person, and the USA is 75 grams per person. Finally, in Mexico, there are no advert advertising campaigns to the increase the sale of dates 
But in the USA, there are strong advertising campaigns. We have this problem in Mexico with the marketing. In Mexico, we are supporting uh, what we know as the, the day route, the, the day tourist route, la ruta turística del Dátil, uh, which consists of day fairs and gala dinners in various day range where it seeks to increase to the uh, day culture in Mexico. We can see some images, uh, for example, uh, the day fairs, La Feria del Dátil in the Mexicali Valley. Another event is uh, Cosecha Senator del Dátil in the Laguna del Sultán in Salvador Colorado Valley. For example, is the King Company with Day King Nights. It's a, a dinner, a, a gala dinner. By the other hand, in Mexico, um, we can find a diversity of day products with add uh, values as such as dates with chocolate, combined with various seeds. Um, it is very common to find uh, the day with chili powder, by the way, uh, very delicious. We can all find uh, dates in products derived from wheat flour, such as pies, cakes, pancakes, etc., and traditional uh, empanadas and tamales. It is also possible to find a uh, date seed coffee, date sugar, to my omelets, date jelly, and date jelly. Sugar, pepper, you know. or, uh, or despite these uh, acceptable numbers, uh, activities, and orders, we have several, several limitations. For example, uh, there is very little support for the Mexican government for the cultivation of the palm. <laughs> So we have very, uh, let it be uh, research and are involved in the in the day pump. In almost of the country, Mexican are not familiar with this fruit. For example, the sorbet of Mexico, and the health benefits of dates have not been exploited. This is the fear festival uh, in Mexico for the first time. Six Mexican companies uh, were invited to participate in the Abu Dhabi Day Pan exhibition in the birds in December 2022, where they exhibited the products and discovered that the quality competes with the best in the world. These companies learned uh, learned. learned from the best companies about the international Arab market. Uh, they learned that to be more competitive and to be able to supply the international market, they must be united in a commercial so society. The image uh, we can see uh, Mexican companies exhibiting their dates in the festival in the in Egypt and Jordan in October and November last. So, thanks to this international experience, Mexican companies understood that to be more competitive, they should be um, organizing a commercial, a commercial society. With this, the marketing company Domex was born. In the image, we can see that it is composed of 25 micro and small day farmers in the Mexicali Valley. Other companies are integrated in a cooperative system in San Luis Colorado. And another are being planned to, uh, into a big company that offers services to the entire day production chain. This is the, all these activities that are carried out in the Mexican day industry. 
uh, companies are beginning to be contacted by international buyers, mainly the today? Yeah, North right. African and Medium Orient. Okay. Mexican yeah. companies begin to produce with higher quality. Likewise, okay. more they, they uh, wow. by products are being developed. More hectares are of they are being planted. Uh, and finally, we expect a growth in the production and the improvement of the industry. In conclusion, although the cultivation of day pan is, re is recently introduced crop in Mexico, it has had an appreciable growth in recent years. The opportunities are greater than the challenge for medial day production in Mexico. The production costs as are much lower in Mexico than in the USA. This represents a great competitive advantage for the Mexican farmers. We can see a strong competitors are observed in the production of medial dates in the medium term. Where the investigation of this crop is required in Mexico. And some parts of Mexico, uh, the medial date is little known. Finally, the Mexican government more reactive support for day farmers and make a wide dissemination on the culture of these fruits. Thank you very much for your attention. See my participation, thank you. All right, thank you very much, Ricardo. Are there any questions? Okay, we have the question number one. Uh, Ricardo has some questions for you, these are not part of the required questions for the quiz, but- Oh, because there is no quiz. There is, uh, yeah, because there's no quiz, but you can answer these. So, true or false, what do you think? True. True, we think it's true, Ricardo. Yes, it's true. Yeah. Question number two. Oh, boy. <laughs> it's a harder question. It's true. Yeah. How many? Good idea. I think two. He thinks two. Two. <laughs> the consensus is two. Question number three. Yep. Large state producing country in the world. What do you think? Egypt. 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 We think it's Egypt. Egypt, yes. Yeah. Not the largest quality date producing country in the world, though. That's another story. It was interesting because although Egypt and Iran and uh, Saudi Arabia, I guess, were really high in overall production, in the production of medjools, uh, United States is, and Mexico is number two. Uh, Israel's number one. Israel's number one. Yeah, that's interesting. So the Arabs eat a different type of date. Yeah. What is that primarily? Would we know it? Oh, it depends on where you are. Uh, Saudi Arabia, they eat one called sagai. Okay, so are those are those soft dates like the medjool kind of or no? Yes, but they're not as large usually. They're the ones that are, you know, they've been grown around there for years and years, hundreds of years. Thousands, maybe. Yeah, thousands of years. Yeah. And every that's <laughs> what they're used to. Yeah, that's what they're used to. So, you know, the medjool comes from Morocco. And so every, but even in Morocco, every oasis has its own native date. And so the, the, the medjool comes from one particular region in Morocco. And you won't find it growing natively in, in the other regions of Morocco, much less in Egypt. So all these, so the medjool has to be imported, like to Mexico or to uh, United States or to Jordan or Palestine, the medjool has been imported to all of those places. Yeah. Except Morocco. Yeah. <clears throat> That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah, they eat different kinds of dates. Yeah. If you come down, next time you come down to Yuma, I have 30 some varieties in my freezer of all different kinds. Yeah. <laughs> what are they doing? What? what? Where are they growing in? Dates? Uh, Yuma County has 6,000 acres. Yeah. Michael. How does China fare in date production or consumption? How does China fare? Do you have an answer for that, Ricardo? About the China. China. 
I think it's probably too cold there. I don't think they produce any, but and they don't consume too many either, but we're working on that. <laughs> yeah. Yes, China, China don't produce dates, only consume. But there is something called a Chinese date. Right, the jujube. Chinese date is a jujube. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Doesn't taste nearly like that. No, like the little <laughs> jujube tree, you mean the, with the little apple thing like and yeah. the dry apple. Yeah, like but them. they sell them dried. Yeah, that's, yeah. So, okay, any more questions? Yeah. All right, thank you very much, Ricardo. Thank, thank you so much, Dr. Gork. Going to talk a little bit about nematicides that we're doing. We're some plant growth regulator research and some brown wood rot research. And nematicide and the plant growth regulators are probably more immediately impactful upon Phoenix area growers. But brown wood rot, I believe I've seen brown wood rot now in Maricopa County in the western part. Some of that stuff that you and I, I believe, looked at over there in that subdivision looked mm -hmm. awfully like brown wood rot. True. So. Uh, and I don't know, Darren Patterson, He, I don't think he's on the line because he had a meeting, but I believe he's told me he may have seen it up there. So, talk about nematodes again. They're microscopic cylindrical worms that <laughs> just live inside the roots. They're parasitic to plants. They feed, not teed, they feed on fibrous roots. They account for, I mean, I personally think that after the brown wood rot, the, nem the nematodes are probably the biggest issue we have in commercial citrus in Arizona. You know, we talk about HLB all day long, but we don't have it. We probably won't have it for a long time, but nematodes is really an issue. And so it's a common problem. And my pictures aren't as beautiful as the ones that uh, Jesse put up, but uh, they do feed on the feeder roots. They lay their eggs uh, down near the posterior end of the adult. They hatch in 12 to 14 days. They migrate to new feeder roots and they go on. And I think what happens is that, you know, when you start out with a new tree, maybe there hasn't been another tree in there for a while. Their population of nematodes is relatively low, but as the tree gets older and the, and the tree can produce feeder roots when it's young and vigorous faster than the nematode population can catch up. But as we go on and on, those of you who are getting old like me, you'll realize you're slowing down a little bit. The tree slows down, the production of feeder roots slows, slows down, the nematode population continues to increase. And eventually you get to the point where even though you have a tree that you've been taking care of for a long time, you're doing a good job at it. The fruit's getting smaller and smaller and the upper part of the tree looks kind of twiggy and the nematode counts are pretty high in the soil. So, uh, but nematicide is something that I think we desperately need here in Arizona. And for homeowners too, it'd be nice if we had one, like the, the question was brought up, Jesse, it'd be nice if the Gowan company or somebody would take one of those nematicides and repackage it for homeowners because we could use it. So we are doing a trial with Celebro. It is on non-bearing lemons because until just a couple of weeks ago, the label was for non-bearing lemons. Uh, the purpose for this was to see if we could replicate some of the issues or some of the results that they're seeing in California on the walnuts and the almonds, where in those areas, application of Celebro really does lead to a large increase in growth. And so that's what we're doing. We're measuring the growth of non-bearing lemons to see whether or not Celebro is actually improving the ability of these lemons to survive. Um, we are treating by spraying the soil and then we're putting some sprinkler pipe down and we're sprinkling it in. And that's because, not that you would necessarily do that in a commercial orchard, but in Yuma, of course, we're flooding and apparently Celebro is quite uh, mobile in the soil. And his thought is that if you just put it down and then you flood irrigate, a lot of that Celebro will go past the tree that we want to test on. So we're, we're doing it this way. Um, presumably there'll be another way of applying it in a commercial orchard that's flood, or maybe we won't have any more flood irrigated orchards in Yuma pretty soon, we'll see. So we're simply looking at these trees and we're measuring tree canopy volume and plant health value. And we've only now just started with that. But we have done some plant health ratings where zero is a dead. It's a very, it's a very subjective number. Well, dead, dead isn't subjective, but zero is not, is pretty obvious. And But five is perfect. And, 
five means you have a good canopy. You can't see through it. All the leaves are green. You may have some flowers or some small fruits. You have new growth. Um, that's a five. And uh, so the ratings of plants treated with at least the high rate of Celebro appears to be a little bit better than the untreated. The untreated is white. The, uh, the uh, Celebro is the red and the and pink. The high level is the pink. The vellum is the blue. And you might say, why are the values going down? Well, we took the measurements in November and we're beginning to see some winter yellows. And so when the tree becomes yellow, then you're not going to get a, a five. You're going to get a lower number. But relatively speaking, they're a little bit better uh, with the Celebro. But it's not, we're not seeing that dramatic improvement that, that I saw the picture that he showed of the, I think they were almonds in California. We're not seeing that dramatic improvement with the citrus. They're a little bit better. Maybe, you know, after another year's worth of looking at it, they'll be more better. We'll see. We're also looking at canopy volumes. Is it possible to move that uh, thing there? So, because you can't see the, yeah. Anyway, again, you know, not a lot of, not a lot of difference. We're talking about almost seven cubic meters versus somewhere between six and a quarter and six and a half. In some of these, so there is, probably a little bit better, a little bit of difference, but it's not anything that's really um, overwhelming at this point. So we'll see, we're continuing to do it. Another nematicide trial, and I have made a mistake because it's not Corteva, it's Syngenta. Uh, they have asked us to look at their new nematicide on bearing citrus. And so this is a trial that we are just have We've made the uh, applications on the trial in, in, in the Imperial Valley. Uh, we're about to finish year one, meaning that we have made the applications of, of everything, and we're waiting to get approval from the grower about when to harvest. This particular uh, experiment is crop destruct, and so they wanted to do all of their harvesting on everything else before they came in and took these ones so that they wouldn't mix any of the lemons uh, of their crop destruct lemons with the ones that are um, that are um, the regular ones. And the reason it's crop destruct is because they, we don't have a label on it yet. Once it begins a label on bearing citrus, it won't be crop destruct anymore. We have eight treatments, uh, basically ranging from nine to 22 fluid ounces per acre. We're also playing Vidate at eight pints per acre, which is the normal um, and we have looked at the root, at the nematode counts, and there does appear to be a reduction in nematode counts as a result of applying the nematicide. Making these applications at the spring root flush, which is and it was in about May, the root flush plus sixty days, and the fall root flush, which was in November. And we are looking at plant health data, which means we're looking for phytotoxicity. We haven't seen any phytotoxicity. And we haven't collected, like I mentioned, we haven't collected yield yet, but we're planning on doing that as soon as the grower gives us the okay. And we're going to take our automated fruit sizer out there and we're going to see if there's an improvement or reduction in fruit size as a result of the treatment. So there are some 96 trees in this particular experiment. And I don't have any data to show you other than the fact that we have no, no um, phytotoxicity. But next time we talk about this, I will. Here's a picture of my guys out in that May, first May application. We apply the product as a soil drench, and then the growers turn on the sprinklers and, and water it in. So question one, which of the following nematodes is most commonly found in citrus? All of them, most of them could be found in citrus, but the answer is A, citrus nematode. I have no idea what the Arizona nematode was, but I probably made these questions at 11 o'clock at night and had to come up with something. So anyway, Robert's a hard taskmaster. He says, make these questions. No, right. we were, <laughs> I was across town doing the same thing. Yeah, all right. Yeah. Okay, then we're looking at plant growth regulators. And uh, they. I've had kind of had an interest over the years in looking at auxins to improve fruit size. And the reason is because, gosh, back in the late 90s, I went over to Spain and talked to them and they said, do you apply auxins to improve plant uh, fruit size? And I said, no. And they said, why not? And I said, well, because it's not labeled. And it's, there's never been one labeled in the U.S. for the purpose 
of improving plant uh, tree uh, fruit size. You can buy oxins. You can do various things with oxins. You can spray them on the on the trees for various reasons, but improving fruit size is not one of them. And they had one over there at the time, which was a relative of two four D, which is called three five six TPA, and uh, and it was pretty good at increasing mandarin size. So a couple of years ago, along comes this company called uh, New Farm. They said, well. We would like to know uh, if you'd like to test our new oxen, which is neither one of those that I mentioned earlier, on improving fruit size. So <clears throat> we are we are working with this stuff they call Coracil. It is an oxen. It's related to 2,4-D, but it's not exactly. And they are working to get a label on it. They don't have one yet. So this again is crop destruct. And the first year we went out there and we had individual trees and we applied the treatment via a backpack sprayer and we had multiple rates and it didn't work. And so we thought, okay, maybe it didn't work because we had we needed to put some kind of a, of a narrow range spray oil in there. And we went out there and we did it again, second year, and it didn't work. So the third year, it's like, I need to stop using a backpack sprayer. I need to put it on a big sprayer with an air blast sprayer. Can you work? Yeah. So I just got a text saying the poles weren't up. Oh. So. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Oh, so yeah, the first, the answer to the first question was citrus nematode. Okay. So this is the third year. Decided to go out and put it out with an air blast sprayer. Uh, we have two treatments in the untreated 26 fluid ounces per acre, 39 fluid ounces per acre. One application in May, we hit it just correctly on the, on, on the sizing, inch to inch and a half in diameter, 12 trees per treatment, uh, spread over various reps, um, that kind of thing. So, and uh, you need to move the top the, the uh, and we got a big difference in yield. And you could go, it's one of those experiments where you could go out to the field and you could look at the trees that have the product on it at the high rate and the and the and the fruit was sagging. There was a lot of extra. So that's over 450 pounds of fruit per tree on the 39 ounce of active ingredient per acre versus about 280 pounds on the controls. And then of course the letters mean that there's a significant difference. So there's a significant difference between A and B and the low rate is in the middle. And I thought, well, that's probably because the fruit got bigger. But so we had also taken fruit and we run it through our fruit sizer and there's no difference in fruit size. So I'm getting improved yield, but I'm not getting any improvement of fruit size. Well, why is that? Well, maybe because it's keeping the fruit from absizing. Maybe we're keeping the fruit from dropping. Or maybe it's because I haven't taken a big enough sample to run through my fruit sizer to get, know whether or not there's a real difference in fruit size or not. So that's where we are. We are the, we're in the third year of the trial, but we're in the first year where we have some decent results. And I didn't tell you the truth, I don't quite understand them at the moment. I'm going <laughs> to talk with the rep and we're going to sit around and drink a beer and, and discuss it and <laughs> see what happens. But, you know, from the standpoint of improving yield, you know, that's pretty good. I would also say that the fruit size on this high rate wasn't any less than the control either. I mean, normally you would say, well, what's happening is that you have more fruit, but the fruit size is smaller. That's not the case. It's not smaller. It's the same size. There was no significant difference of any size, you know, 63, 75, 95, 115, 140, all those fruit sizes that you get for lemons, no difference whatsoever. So did that increase the growth of the tree too, or the substantial strength of the limbs? You start pouring on extra fruit, you're going to have well, more breakage. I didn't notice any more breakage. So, let's see. We did harvest all the fruit at once in November. We didn't let it sit there. So, I don't know. So, the plant growth regulator that we're applying to lemons is registered. Uh, it, the correct answer is B in Europe, not in the United States. It will be registered in the United States, I presume, uh, for citrus, but not yet. 
Now the brown wood rot research. The causal agent is Fomatopsis melliae. Um, that was some recent work that uh, Alex Hu did and I did. He did the, the DNA work and we published a couple papers on this. We've done a number of things. And to be honest with you, we've looked at this, at this disease since, gosh, since 1994, 1995, when it was first reported in Yuma and we called it Coneophora at that time, which was correct. Then we called it Antrodia, which was an incorrect name, but we, we couldn't distinguish between Antrodia. We didn't have the tools to distinguish between Antrodia and Fomatopsis at that time. Those two fungi are very closely related, and only if you do DNA work can you tell the difference between, between uh, Antrodia and Fomatopsis. But the work was done, and we discovered that it was Fomatopsis, and we feel that's correct, not only because of the DNA work, but also because in Sicily and in Italy, there is, there is there are reports of trees, lemon trees, getting infected with Fomatopsis. So I think we're correct. We put a bunch of spore traps out for a number of years in various orchards in Yuma County and in Imperial County to see whether or not there was a difference in spore production. So this Fomatopsis, what it does is it makes fruiting bodies that you can find on dead wood in the orchard. It makes spores. The spores blow into the cracks in the branches, which is why the branch breakage is so important. And once it gets in there, it, it consumes the cellulose and the hemicellulose of the, of the wood and the branches break. And it, ultimately it gets in the trunk and the tree splits in half and it falls down, okay? And we thought, okay, well, maybe we could put these spore traps in. These are little traps that would trap the air and would collect the spores, you know, once an hour for five minutes. And we would have to uh, learn whether or not there was some seasonality. So we could do some, we could, we could pinpoint our treatments based on where the spores blow. And we found out there was no real seasonality difference. They make spores year round. Okay. There's a few less in the hottest part of the year, but not a lot. And the other thing I will tell you is uh, these spore traps were made in Great Britain. Has anybody ever brought a car from Great Britain? Breaks well, down all the time. There's a reason for that. Breaks down all the time. They broke down all the time. The spore traps were terrible. So we unboxed, we had six of them and we unboxed them and we looked at the screws and all the screws were different. So like they had gone to the hardware store and picked out the screws that fit. It was crazy. So now we have a couple different approaches to brown wood rot research. One is curative. What we do is we get some dowels at Hobby Lobby, cut them into small pieces. We invest them in a Petri plate with the fungi. We take a drill, we drill a hole in the tree, we insert the dowel, we, we seal it with a little bit of wax or something like that. Then we spray the tree, okay, for a number of times. And, we, and then about a year later, we take those branches and we take those branches off and we split them in half and we measure the length of the lesion to see whether or not the spray has reduced the growth of the lesion. That's one way. The second way is preventative. We spray the tree with fungicides and then we go up and down every once in a while and we look at the tree and we say, that's brown wood rot, that's brown wood rot. We count the number of instances we see it. Now we haven't gone through and identified exactly if it's fomatopsis or something else but we're going to presume that these fungus fungicides make some difference on most of these fungi. So the other thing that we've worked on is this stuff called zincicide. Okay, zinc, we've done pretty much the same thing with zincicide. These are zinc nanoparticles. They have some systemic activity. We're interested in fungicides that have some systemic activity because since this fun fungus is in the wood, we would like to have some ability for the fungi to fungus fungicide to get in there and kill the the um, the uh, fun fungus in the wood. We infested the branches in September using that the dowel method. We applied the various rates of zinc aside. I'm not going to spend too much time on this. We cut and split the branches in June of 2023. This is, the, this is the area in square centimeters, and you can see the middle is untreated control, 13 uh, square centimeters, and we have some at 10 and some at 16, and there's no difference there, no difference whatsoever. Then I decide, well, we'll, we'll measure the length, not the area, no difference, no difference whatsoever. So we're not gonna mess with zinc aside anymore, it doesn't work. But 
did go and we got some fungicides and we did pretty much the same thing. So Alex down in Tucson has come up with a list of fungicides and he has a bigger list now, but at the time he had about 13 of them that he thought might work. They work in the Petri plate in the laboratory, okay? He would put the fungus in the Petri plate, he would put the fungicide in the Petri plate and the fungicide would kill the fungus. It's not difficult to kill this fungus. Lots of things kill it. The problem is that once it gets in the wood, you can't get at it. So he thought, all right, I'm going to use these fungicides. One of our growers in Yuma said, will you use the bioflora mix that they're, they're touting as one of, the, one of the treatments? So we said, yeah, we'll include this bioflora mix, which is a bunch of stuff from bioflora. We added this and we <clears throat> selected six branches per treatment. We infested them in August and we sprayed. Okay. We, we sprayed, well, actually for a couple of them, we sprayed beforehand. And then we sprayed in September, we sprayed in February, we sprayed in May, 250 gallon breaker. We went in there with an air blast sprayer. Then we cut the branches out in July of 2023 and we split them in half. So these are the treatment, treatment times. Well, in this case, we had some differences. There weren't quite significant, but almost. So the black is the untreated control. We had 12 centimeters of lesion length. I'll show you what that looks like. We had cannonball down there with only five. Okay. Mentor, almost six. Some of them are in the seven to eight range. So this is pretty interesting. I've been working on this for a long time with Mike Matheron and Alex and some other people, and we've never found anything that works. So I'm pretty excited that we've actually found a couple of these products that seem to work, at least to reduce the growth of the fungus inside the branch for at least the first year. Then we looked at the square centimeters and there was a significant difference, it's the same, but it's the same idea, the cannonball and the mentor, you know, there was some difference in the, in the width of the lesion versus the length. So I thought I would have both. So there were some significant differences. Seva is terrible. Um, so it's, it's, it's promising. Here's what it looks like. There's the untreated. Okay, you can see, I'm gonna come up here. I realize that you're online, you can, can't see, but look at the picture there. See this arrow right here. The lesion goes from that arrow to the other. This is the untreated. Okay, and the other one then is the mentor. See the arrow, which tells you how wide that, that lesion is. So the mentor has decreased the growth of the fungus by a lot. So. We want to do this again, not surprisingly, um, but that was pretty impressive. So, <clears throat> let's see, is there a reason? Am I not? It's not. It's not working again. Not I did. Okay. Then we used the same thirteen fungicides, and we went out and we sprayed them with the air blast sprayer on nine trees per treatment, and we went out and we counted. Yeah, counted evidence of brown wood rot. And then once we did, we pruned it out. Okay, so we found it, said this is it, we pruned it out, and we went back later and we did it again. Okay, so we, we, we made three applications in 2023, and those are the same dates. This is what it looked like. Okay, so this is the incidence of brown wood rot in 2023. This is additive, okay? And untreated is uh, the one, two, three, four, fifth from the from the right. Okay, so it's got eleven. We have a couple of them at three. Okay, and a couple of them at seven. So we are beginning to see some uh, some results there too. So we want to do this again too. We have a project in with the Arizona Citrus Research Council to do, among other things, this work again. So we will see if it gets funded and we will see uh, what, uh, what, what kind of results we come up with. Now, separately, we have noticed, as I do a lot of work in the, in the Coachella Valley uh, and in the, and the Imperial Valley, uh, I noticed that I was seeing this uh, problem in California. So California growers wanted us to do a survey so anytime we didn't specifically go out and, out and look for disease, but anytime we saw something that was dead, we collected it. So we collected 62 examples of disease. 
those 62, 26 of them were Fomatopsis. There were a bunch of other ones. The Coniophora showed its head again. But we found, and it's not the only ones that are out there. As I drive through there and more, I'm seeing more and more of this. But we found basically Fomatopsis everywhere. We found it in Blythe. We found it in Imperial County. We found it in Coachella. We found it in Borrego Springs. So it's in California as well. Uh, and the folks in California have don't really, frankly, understand. A couple, few people do, but the growers are not nearly as cognizant of this disease as um, those of us in Arizona are because it hasn't. This it, it's a, a later arrival. So as a result of that, which was a, a one year trial, we have now been funded to do two sites in California, in Nyland, California, and Three Flags, which is a ranch just south of the um, Riverside County line on the south, on the west side of the Salton Sea. And we are going to identify and characterize 660 trees that are in the trial, 330 in each site. We're going to apply fungicidal treatments of various types starting in February. We're going to evaluate the effectiveness of those fungicides. We're going to use a drone this time instead of walking. We're going to walk, but we're going to use a drone as well. And then we're going to do it again. We're going to see. We're going to do some other things to, with this particular trial as well. Those, these are the potential fungicides. You'll note some of them are different than what uh, we had we were doing in Arizona, and we will add the ones that do well, done well in Arizona to this list, but there are some of these like Biotem and Vintech, which are, um, uh, I forgot what class of fungicides those are, but those are biologicals. So as Alex says that those work very well in as well. So this is something that's upcoming. Uh, and actually, I don't have a slide for it. We have another trial, again, that we've asked the Arizona Council to fund, which involves the, um, you want to apply the fungicide to the, to, the, uh, to the branches, and then we want to use the HPLC to determine how long it persists and how far it moves from the place where we apply it to the place where, you know, does, it, does it stay right where we apply it or does it, is, it, is it systemic? So that's something that we hope we hope will get funded. So question three, citrus brown wood rot is correct answer is C, Fomatopsis melia. Ben, yeah. are the others not causing a problem anymore or just to a lesser degree than uh, Fomatopsis? So, we, so everything that we called Antrodia is really Fomatopsis. Coniophora we have, it's found in Arizona for years. So I was really surprised to see a cluster of it in this near Westmoreland, California. But, you know, it was identified properly. These others are mostly uh, diseases of smaller branches. So, you know, you can get disease fomatopsis in a large branch or in a trunk. It'll split it. But most of these others are, are smaller, you know, branches that are uh, maybe a quarter of inch or less in diameter. So, so they do exist, but they're not, and they're not nearly as problematic as fomatopsis. Michael, you used a term crop destruct. Yes. What so is when we're doing experiments on a product that's not been labeled, uh, well, let me back up. Normally, all the lemons that are grown on the University of Arizona farm or in a natural orchard go to the packing house. But when we're using, when we're doing an experiment on a product that is not labeled, we can't allow those lemons to enter the commerce. Therefore, that becomes crop destruct. We take those lemons and we dump them. They never make it to the packing. So that's what that means. So uh, it's a safety measure. You know, not that, you know, naturally they're going to be, these are going to be labeled. And so eventually lemons with, that have been, that, that have been harvesting trees with these particular products will make it into commerce, but they don't want to do that until actually the labeling is complete. All right, any additional questions? All right, dates. We're going to talk about water use. We're going to talk about fruit thinning and sizing and some black mold. So we have this project where we're measuring date palm water use, and it involves some sensors that we're installing into the palm fronds. And you can see, I'll show you a better picture of what the sensor looks like, but the picture on the left is a picture of the sensor itself. 
we have either three or four sensors in eight different palm trees. And each sensor is attached to a wire. The wires then go to this box, which you see in the middle, the Adafic Scientific box. These sensors are manufactured by Adafic Scientific. And then the, then there's a wire that goes from it to a data logger. And then we collect the data <laughs> off the data logger. And what these sensors do is they measure water flow through that frond. We've been collecting water. We've been collecting data every 10 minutes since February of 2021. We have a load of data, okay? That if it was just me, I'd probably just throw up my hands and say, I have no idea what to do with that. Hey, hi. We had, yeah. Hey, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, that's where we're going with this. And so we have it underneath, a, we have it under on a, we, these uh, data loggers are controlled and the sensors are controlled by the solar panel. So we have a big concrete block in the orchard and we have to have some shade. And so it was a big, it was a big effort to get all this stuff put in, but it's been collecting water. And it actually we stopped, we stopped at the end of September of this year. So we have approximately two and a half years worth of data every 10 minutes. Well, we hope we do, that would be ideal. What we found is that sometimes we don't necessarily get the data, but we have so many different, we have 30 different sensors. So somewhere in those 30 sensors, we're gonna have a sensor that provides us with some data because the fronds are all about the same. So basically the sensor looks like this. It has a heat probe, uh, which is the one in the center and it has two temperature probes. And then, so the heat probe provides a pulse of heat and then it, it measures how long it takes for the heat to reach the top or the bottom sensor. And when that happens, that will give you an idea of how fast the water is running through the, running through the front because the water is conducting the heat from the, probe, from the center probe to the one that's above and the ones, one that's below. So once you know that, you have some idea of how much water is going through. We have to put in some extra correction factors for the wood density and for the diameter of the frond. And there's another additional complication. And, and this is kind of basically what it would look like if I was doing a, I was doing a um, uh, dicot, okay? This kind of gives you an idea of the temperature of the, how the heat pulse method works. And this would be all great if I was doing it in a die cot because you could put the pulse in to the, the probe into the, the um, die cot, which is on the left. And you could get those probes into the xylem, which is where they need to go, which is the center part. Um, it's also called the pith or the cortex. It's kind of there in the middle. We have a pretty good idea. In the case of a monocot, like a palm tree, the xylem is scattered in all those bundles, okay? So it's not quite as straightforward as whether or not we're actually going to get some real values or not. Nobody's ever really done this before, but I don't know how else to, to figure out in situ water use without putting a date palm in a pot, weighing the weight of the pot, which is the, what the Israelis have done. So we're... The manufacturers tell me that they have had some success with oil palm in Malaysia. So I'm hoping that we'll have some success with, with date palm. We can't put these probes directly in the trunk because if you know the date palm trunk, it's covered with these leaf bases, which are hard and woody and you have to excavate out and that kind of thing. It's not nearly as easy as it would be if I was putting it into a citrus tree. So that's why we've why we've resorted to putting these things in the bottoms of the fronds, which ultimately means once we have values, we have to multiply that by the number of fronds on a tree, which adds a whole other layer of complexity. So we're hoping to get something close to what reality is um, and and come up with some values which will help uh, be able to tell how much water the tree is using in the day and the night and you know in the summer and the winter and that kind of thing, which we've never been able to do before. So you're putting a probe into brand new fronds or the older ones? Or? Well, we started out with ones that were neither brand new nor old, but we have had to move them because it's two and a half years later, some of the ones that we started out with that were, I guess, middle-aged are now old and they're beginning to die. Right, yeah. So at some point we moved them to another one. Know, which adds another layer of complexity to this. But 
you know, again, I, I kind of feel like nobody's ever done this before, so I can do all of these kinds of things, you know, nobody's gonna, nobody's gonna complain. So we don't know if it's gonna work, we hope so. Uh, and so what we did with all that data is there is a group on campus that one of the computer people, and they have people that have done this kind of thing before, and they're in the middle of, of basically sorting through my data and compressing it down to something that I can understand. And I, I emailed them about two weeks ago and I said, have you got anything? And they said, it's going to take another four weeks. So I don't have any data for you, but in a couple of weeks, I should at least have some values. So that's what we're doing with date, with date palm water use. We're trying to figure out if we have some, can get some realistic, real numbers. So like I say, February, 2021, lots of data and it's being analyzed. And hopefully by the time the grant runs out, we'll have an answer. So Otherwise, we'll ask for a no-cost extension, but I think we will have an answer. Now, so question one, dates are blank. Dates are monocots. That would be D, and therefore measuring water use in the plant is not straightforward, at least not as straightforward as a, as a die cut. So the correct answer is D. Now, a number of years ago, we looked at fruit load reduction due to thinning. We asked the growers, you know, how much of the fruit do you think is lost when you do thinning? How much is thrown on the ground? Because that's basically what happens. And we all said, well, probably about 60 to 70 percent. But at least in 2010, they were wildly wrong. There were some orchards. These are various orchards down here at the bottom in, the Yuma, in Yuma County and in Bard. And uh, in some of these orchards, they threw over 90% of the fruit on the ground during the thinning process, which is why it costs, it's so costly. In 2011, I guess maybe they had fewer fruits, so they were sitting in the 65 to 75% range. But the point is a lot of the fruit is thrown on the ground. And that's a lot of labor costs, okay? So what you could do, and, and so I, I would say is what we would typically do in dates, the traditional method of thinning is you have a strand in front of you and you hand remove every other one. So you have about an inch between them on, this, on you have two inches between, the dates are alternate. So you have about two inches between dates on the same side, or you have one inch between dates, which are, you know, from the right side to the left side. You can imagine, you know, that's a big, big chunk of the $16,000 an acre that it costs to grow dates. And, you know, and that you all and how know. How do you even work inside the bundle? It's so tight out there, you know? Yeah, right. Well, we cut out the centers, of course, and that kind of thing. But that that's the traditional way because then what it allows is it, is a, it allows the number of fruit you want spread out over a long strand, which improves the, the air movement through there, which reduces the chance for mold at harvest time. But some of the growers have decided that what they're going to do is what we lovingly call the Israeli method, which is where you simply go in and you clip the strands and you leave them all, you know, you remove half or three quarters of the, of the, of the bunch by simply clipping the strands and you leave them all jammed up together, which leaves you with the same number of fruit approximately as the traditional method, but they're all a lot closer together. So, how can we get bigger quality good fruit without with reduced labor costs? You know, because like Ricardo said, it what is twenty dollars an hour more or less for for, for uh, labor in the U.S. is twenty dollars a day in Mexico. So, so we did a number of years ago look at this strand cutting, and we did do treatment one, which is the typical Yuma. Arizona methodology. We left 45 strands for bunch. We thinned to 15 to 20 fruits per strand and we removed the centers. And another one was just what, kind of what we call the, the Israeli method. We had 45 strands per bunch. We cut to 15 to 20 fruits per strand, but we, and we took the centers out, but we cut them rather than thin them. So the strands were much, much smaller. Then there was the one where we just left it alone. We had 90 strands per bunch. We cut to 10 fruit per strand. So we jammed it up even closer together and we didn't take the centers out. So we had a lot of fruit that was all jammed up close together. The yields overall were the same, the pre-sort, okay? The growers go through and they you could take the yield, but then you end up sorting out the culls. And in this case, we haven't done that yet. So the fruit, you have more fruit on number three, but the fruit's a little bit smaller. And so the yield is overall about the same as one. 
But then we remove the coals. If you keep an eye on the red part, which is the trash, okay, number one, which is the old method where you space the food out on a strand, which is long, allows air movement through there, and you don't have a lot of loss, you know, you have maybe 10% loss due to mold, whatever leads to trash, okay? But B and C, where you clip the strands and you leave them a lot closer together, which saves you labor costs, means that you have more loss, okay? Especially C, you had approximately 30 to 40% loss of the crop as a result. Well, that's not tenable. So what's happening right now is some of the growers are, are the, the pressure is to do treatment too, okay? Because of the high labor costs. And some growers are doing that. Other growers are maintaining, number one, they have generally better quality, but, at, but it costs more labor. And of course, this also depends on the rain, okay? If we have a rainy year, then you're gonna see this as an issue. If we have a dry year or less humidity during harvest time, then there might not be any differences. So, you, you know, and you can't predict the weather. So you never know. So you make, the, you know, you gamble in the spring when it's time to thin, but then, you know, if you have a wet year or it rains just before you harvest and you have no, you know, no idea if that's gonna happen, sometimes you end up with a 30% or a 40% loss. And that's what happened last year in our entire industry. They lost about 30 to 40, but last year, meaning the 22 season, they lost about 30 to 40% of the crop because of black mold, which was found in the dates because most of the growers are moving to this methodology where they keep the dates all bunched together, which leads to more black mold. Was it weather related pretty much last year? Yeah, it was. A little more moisture. A little there. more moisture. Tight, yeah. tight bunches and more mold. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas this year they didn't have as much of an issue with that. But again, you never know, yeah. you know. So so the question is, can we thin, at least do part of our thinning and while reducing the labor costs? And so we are working with two PGRs manufactured by Valent Biosciences, which is, which is just up there to tell you that it's not some fly by night company. One is organic and the other is not. The reason that is is the growers would like to see something organic because it's their goal that 100% of the industry go only organic fruit by 2025, okay? which they may meet. Okay? Both of these are already used to thin deciduous fruit, and actually one is a precursor of the other, but I'm not going to tell you what it is yet because I'm not willing to do that. But we are spraying them directly on the flowers or the fruitlets to drip. That is, we go up there into the, into the basket with a backpack sprayer, we have the mix mixed up. We spray on the flowers and it causes some of the flowers to upsize or the fruitlets to upsize. So the first year, 2022, that we did this, we only had two different rates. We had 100 parts per million and 200 parts per million. So you can see down at the bottom, it says 100 or 200, okay? And we sprayed at three different growth stages. We sprayed, we sprayed on the flowers that were just emerging from the spathe. And at the point when they just emerge from the spathe, they're cream colored. So the bars where we spray the cream colored flowers are cream colored, okay? Nice. Yeah. And you can see we removed in some cases, maybe 30%, 30 to 40% of the crop, okay? I don't know why that one was 147. Who knows what happened there, okay? Then we sprayed another bunch on the same day, as it turns out, on flowers that were past that stage. They were a little bit older. So I call this kind of the green, the middle green. And we really had no effect whatsoever. So we, we just did it, okay? And then we sprayed a little bit on the, uh, on the uh, fruitlets, okay? That's the dark green. You can see the dates down there. That was about three and a half weeks later, we sprayed on the fruitlets. <laughs> And in some cases, uh, we, we really didn't make a whole lot of difference. So we did it again. Uh, and we were a little bit more religious about getting our applications on. And we used some other rates. We used some 500 parts per million rates. And in this case, we really did uh, cause some thinning. So again, we have the cream colored flowers in the beginning. We we were able to remove anywhere between 50 and 60% of them. 
when the fruits, when the flowers are a little bit older, we were only able to remove, well, in one case, we removed 75, but in another case, we removed up to maybe 20, 30 percent. And then when the when you have the fruitlets, the, you know, the ones that are pea sized, we were able to remove somewhere around 25 to 60 percent, depending upon what, what PGR we use. And, and sometimes we have a nice curve, like you can see the PGR1, 100 parts per million on the green fruit. And we were at 100 parts per million, we removed 27% of the fruit. We were at, versus the untreated, we removed 44% at 500 and we removed 53% at 1,000. So, uh, so we're probably gonna go back and look at that where we begin to have some kind of a, some kind of a curve. See what I'm saying? So we're going to go back and look at this again this coming year. We're going to uh, add additional intermediate levels. We're probably going to stop looking at the older flowers and only focus on the fruitlets or the young flowers. We're not expecting that we remove all the fruit with the spray, all the flowers with the spray, but if we can remove a lot of it and then have them come back and do more hand labor to finish the job, I think that's where we want to go. So this looks pretty promising. Um, again, it, it's going to take, we haven't done any economics yet. So once we come up with some rates and that we think work, then we're going to have to go back and see if it makes sense economically, but that's, that's where we are with that. So two plant growth regulators used for date fruit thing will be organic, conventional, or both. And the answer at the moment is both. I think the growers would like it to be a organic, but we're not there yet. So at the moment, the answer is C, both. Then at one point, I uh, received a, every once in a while I get dissertations from overseas. And I got one a number of years ago from this guy in Pakistan, and he was spraying dates with mineral salts to improve the fruit size. And he was, and he showed a real big difference. And so I thought, oh, let's see if we can't replicate that on Majul, because he wasn't working on Majul, it was some other variety from Pakistan. And so I got a grant and we looked at that and we did a pilot study um, last year and we made applications of potassium nitrate and urea at various concentrations and potassium sulfate and one was boron and it was a very small trial and in one case we had fruit that was 62 percent larger than the control. I was thrilled. That was pretty interesting, pretty good. And we made three applications basically a month apart. We, we went up there again, we sprayed the fruit to drip with the materials. It's easy to mix it up. It's just mineral salts and we did the job. This was the treatment list that we had. And if you want to see more of this, I can send it to you. But it was just one tree per treatment. And we didn't really have an issue with fruit quality. If you look at the gray part of the bars, that was the good, the normal fruit. Uh, and actually, uh, the yellow stuff was the yellow bars was the skin separation. So one of the treatments led to a little bit more skin separation. Uh, we did have a few fruit with larvae and that kind of thing, a few fruit with mold. But by and large, you know, if you get 70, 80 percent fruit that's good quality, this is what it looked like. This is the treatment that was 63 percent larger, and this was the treatment that was not. And you'll also see that it affects maturity. It's a lot more yellow fruit in the, in the control. This is the fruit that was sprayed with the potassium sulfate and urea. So we thought we would do it again and we would increase the number of trees. And we made the applications and we don't have near the we don't have near the as good an effect this year as we had last year. We have some improvement. Some of them were 16%, 17%, 19% better than the better than the uh, and the treated, the untreated, but it wasn't as nearly as as uh, uh, thrilling as as the year before that. So, Glenn, uh, do you think some of that might be related to that weather difference you were talking be. about earlier? It could be. Maybe I mean, some fruit. kind of a disease resist uh, preventative or yeah, something. yeah. I mean, I mean, with the the dates, everything bloomed slow last year. It was cold. Uh, we didn't make the applications at the at the correct time, and then it got hot, and they speeded up. So we didn't quite hit the month. We were going about three weeks apart rather than a month. 
So it didn't work. That's the bad news. The good news is I have another year on the grant to try it again. So we're going to try and do it again. Um, we're going to try and, and and hit those spray dates a little bit better. Hopefully, we'll have a little bit more. Do that. Try to spray. We'll see what happens. And this is something that the growers, the date growers, are really interested in seeing. And I think they may fund a few more years of this if need be to get something that works. Because my idea is, boy, it'd be really great if we could go and we could do some spraying on the trees and do most of the thinning. And then we can do another spray on the tree and we can size the fruit more than that. That would be great. That would be the idea. Then finally, we've talked a bit about the black mold and you can see it in the middle of this medjool date here. And that's like I mentioned, a real issue being last year, we had 30 to 40% loss. And of course, what that means is that when you're going, it's very difficult when this is in the packing house to sort through and find the dates that have the mold and then the company was getting calls from Des Moines or places like that. You know, some lady calls and, you know, opens up her date that she got in her natural delights package and there's mold in there. And so she calls the company and then, and, and then they said it, it, it cost them a whole lot of extra money to sort through all the dates because of the issue with mold. And so their, their throughput of dates through the factory was a lot slower last year. And so as a result, many, but not all, the date growers into the 22 season lost money because of the black mold problem because it was pretty wet. They had humidity issues. So there is a paper out of Israel which suggests that the black mold problem begins at pollination. If you look at the date palm, at the date fruit, there is a period of time where the, the when the fruit's very small, there's an opening there. The paper suggests that the date that the fungus gets in that flower in that fruitlet, sorry, just at pollination time or a little bit after that. So our idea is why not make fungicidal applications to the date fruit either at pollination or just after pollination. So we have recently been funded to do that. We're going to start in February or March. This is the data from the paper, uh, figure seven from the paper that, uh, that uh, Yuval Cohen and his co-authors have the, these are two different locations in Israel, uh, A and B. Uh, the untreated tree, untreated fruit is the control. They're the black bar. And the DSO and the DS2 are the stage of spraying of the whatever, whatever kind of fungicide they used. And so you can see they have, in the one case, they have moved the infestation rate from about 13% to less than 5%. And in the second location, which is probably further north in Israel, where it's more humid, they have the station rate from about 37, 38% to somewhere below 20, 10 to 20%. If we can do that in the jewels, that would be great. So that's kind of what we're going to do. We're going to try and duplicate their results in 2024. We're going to inoculate fruit with the mold. We're going to select the fungicides. We've started to do that already. We're going to apply the fungicide either with the pollen or just after pollination. We may apply pollen in a liquid form. That is, we'll mix it with water and spray it up there instead of the traditional way that people apply pollen around here, which is dry. But the liquid method is a well-established method, which they use around the world. And then we're going to measure the degree of infestation at harvest time. And then we're going to do it again. So that's kind of what we have in mind for this particular project. So any questions? Is that a uh, problem here in Arizona production? Yeah. 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 All of that, I mean, the, the growers in Yuma lost 30 to 40%. Yeah. You know, it's also, it also, uh, Aspergillus niger, it gets into all kinds of other crops. Yeah. So it's visible uh, to the eye. No. How do you scan it in a factory and find it? <laughs> the, they have, well, I think it's visible, but you have to have a very trained eye. And they still don't get them all. What about so they have people looking at every fruit, yeah. and they they, you know, sometimes you can tell, but not always, because a lot of it got through last year. I wonder if that mold fluoresces differently. I. It might be to tell with certain lights, you know. Yeah. But you, yeah, but you'd have to scan them. Yeah, you'd have to scan them, but you'd have to go through this. You have to yeah. go through the fruit flesh. Or in yeah. yeah. But it's translucent. I mean the. Fruit yeah. kind of right. I mean, so it'd be great if we had some way of of scanning it out, but we don't want it in there to start with. Yeah. So 
So you said that they that you mix uh, date pollen with water and put it up as a slurry kind of a stuff. Yeah. And, and it pollinates the flowers. That yeah. way, obviously, it does. Yeah. You said it's good around the world. Yeah, I've seen it done in Saudi Arabia. Ricardo wrote a paper on it. Someone at, at yesterday's talk yesterday said to not use cornstarch to use oh, yeah. instead. Yeah, they mix it with different things to. Yeah, he said he's. Extended. Well, yeah, but don't use cornstarch because, of course, you mix that with the water and it'll it'll mess it up. You get yeast or something. You got to buy it. Yeah, you got it right. He said use mineral mineral salts or you could use 100% pollen. I actually think they I actually think they use 100% pollen. But I'll have to go back and look. So we're not exactly sure whether we'll do the dry method or the wet method. Maybe we'll do one. So you say most people here do dry. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. You know, they just shake. It. You shake. Well, well I mean, actually, yeah, yeah. It's got actually, 5,000 acres. Yeah. <laughs> Go out there with shake, the yeah. Most of the growers here don't shake anymore. They have a modified leaf blower. Blower. Well, yeah. You're saying leaf blower. Yeah. Down at the bottom. And they have a venturi. Sucks it up really? into the yeah. airstream. And it works. That's the, that's the normal way nowadays. You know, when you've got hundreds of acres or tens of acres. But it's still going to have to have somebody cut the pollen pods and shake them to get yeah. all the pollen out. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Still have to do that. So, so the, these guys have got these big date plantings in Bard and Yuma County. Obviously, they're harvesting male trees. They must have an orchard of male trees only that they grow the well, it, it, the it's, pollen. It's 49 to 1. They usually put the one the ma the males at the edge of the orchard. Well, so they still grow them out there among all the female trees. Yeah, but it's right at the edge, not not dispersed within the females. And so males typically ripe the the flowers are ready a, a week or two early, so they'll they'll pull those spades off in advance, or they'll have pollen they've frozen from the previous year and use that to begin the season. So, all right. Any other questions? Uh, one other question. Yeah. How old does the date usually have to be before they quit sending pups up? What's the variety? <laughs> Jewel? Yeah, well, Jewel or Barhees or any of them, yeah, really. Most of them. set so few. Yeah. I would say probably 15, 20 years. A year. Stop. The Jewel may be 15 or 20 years as well, but they'll put on three or four or five a year. Barhees may be put on one a year or maybe not. Well, will they put more pups on if you cut the other ones off? Or are they just, because you usually, they, have, they tell you to wait to the least six inches in diameter before you remove one. Oh, six inches in diameter for the trunk. Yeah. The trunk of the yeah. Plant. Well, they, I don't know. But they preferably don't. have air roots already or roots on them. You don't yeah. Get yeah. Near right. yeah. Well, some of the dates will actually make pups that are air. Out, out yeah. Out. But, but I've never seen roots on those. And they're harder. It's hard as hell to start. Right. I don't know. And the price of pups these days, yeah, nuts. Yeah, yeah. What? What? Well over a hundred dollars. Yeah, year. sure. Oh, yeah. I've seen some two. well over two hundred. Yeah. Well, you come down to Yuma, they're they're they have so many that the prices are down. Yeah. So they burn them. They burn them. Yeah, because right now we're not putting any more orchards in because the labor costs are so high. If the orchards are going in, they're going in Mexico. We're investing in Mexico orchards and the demand, right? Demand's the issue. The demand, so last year I would have told you that the demand was so low that they had to store fruit. But the reality of the issue was is there was the largest farm in Arizona sold to another another buyer, and they had to keep those dates in the freezer as an asset. So that was a mistake because you know you keep you keep incurring freezer costs, therefore you actually lost money and they but now they've eliminated, they've got rid of all that. So I don't think they have an oversupply of dates anymore. I mean, just globally, right? I mean, globally, like they have an oversupply. Countries are eat, have been eating dates forever, but to the yeah. rest of the world. Globally, there is an oversupply of medjool, <laughs> but I think if we can market them properly, there won't be. I have a friend from Egypt who did a very nice publication, a presentation that suggests that given population growth and growth of the trees, the number of trees, Pretty soon we won't have enough medjools to meet demand. It's so, an education thing, right? People yeah. aren't used to eating those things because yeah, they're so right. expensive. Right. They are. Have you seen the latest that the Bar Valley people are doing? It's date, it's date strips covered with tahini. 
cover what? To heat. You know that stuff that you put on a mango nada. You know that that you know the Hispanics they sprinkle this hot sauce, hot powder, yeah. chili powder that's sweet and hot. They're re it's really quite good. Yeah. <laughs> Very good on watermelon. Yeah, it's good on watermelon. Yeah, but it's really good. I like it on dates. Yeah, huh. I do think. Yeah, does it taste better than palm but palm beetle larvae? Without a doubt. <laughs> no, I've never tried palm beetle larvae with to aim. You'll probably so. approve it. <laughs> okay, on that note, I think it's time to go home. <laughs> Thank you for attending and uh, have a happy holidays. Thank you. And we'll Thank see you. you all hopefully next year.